The hearing is coming to order. Good morning, and thank you everyone for coming to today's hearing. I am Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel, and I chair the Committee on Public Housing. And I am joined right now by Committee Member, Council Member Ruben Diaz Sr. The subject of today's hearing is Tenant Participation Activity Funds, also known as TPA funds. The term TPA funds describes an allocation of money provided by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, known as HUD, to public housing authorities, such as NYCHA, which in turn distributes the funds to resident councils. Resident councils, or what we refer to as resident associations, may use these funds to support activities that improve resident satisfaction and quality of life, foster self-help initiatives, and enable residents to create a positive living environment for families living in public housing. The rules that govern this funding allocation is dictated in clear words within Code for Federal Regulations 24 CFR 964.150, along with Notice 2013-21 that was issued in August, on August 23, 2013. The notice explains the role of the Public Housing Authority, the role of the Resident Council, allowable activities, along with details about other administrative information. TPA funds are a valuable resource for residents. And in my previous role as a member of NYCHA's Department of Community Engagement and Partnerships, I worked to figure out ways to make these funds more accessible. I played a role in drafting the guidebook utilized today that explains how TPA funds are administered so that residents can connect to much needed services. Still, now as a member of the New York City Council, I continue to hear concerns from residents that NYCHA is falling short in its administrative responsibilities and being supportive of proposals, supportive of projects, and supportive of the overall association body. According to federal regulations, housing authorities such as NYCHA must, upon request, guide residents in establishing and maintaining resident associations. NYCHA must offer trainings to resident associations and engage residents about its TPA policies. Importantly, NYCHA must collaborate with resident associations on the distribution of funds. In recent years, NYCHA has undergone reforms to improve the administering of the TPA funds. And we know that there was a hearing on TPA funds in 2017. So today's hearing gives us the opportunity to reflect on what has worked, what has not, and what residents should expect from NYCHA moving forward. I look forward to hearing from NYCHA residents this morning and advocates about strengthening their partnership and optimizing the TPA process. As NYCHA moves into the land of unknown, residents should, have, should be able to have control over how they can improve their lives, the lives of their neighbors, and the overall experience in their developments. So with that being said, we have 12 residents who are signed this morning to testify, who came in early to be heard. We will break into three separate panels of resident panels before we hear from NYCHA. And because we have so many residents who would like to speak, we will have to put you on a timer, and so there will be a three-minute timer per speaker. And hopefully, this will help guide the discussion after with NYCHA based on what the residents actually said before. And we have been joined by committee member, council member Diana Ayala. And so now we will first see a short video about the TPA program and the commercial car program with NYCHA. We will first watch the video and then we will immediately go into the resident panels. 
So first we will hear from, one sec, before we hit play on the video, I just wanna call um, the first panel just to be seated and then we'll go into the video. So the first panel will be Karen Blondell, Crystal Glover, Ms. Lozano, and Robert Hall. And I do apologize from the beginning to the residents. We really do have to adhere to the time frame. And so if you are going over a little bit, I am going to have to remind you. Three minutes. And I see that some have prepared remarks and some are pretty lengthy. And so again, a reminder about the time frame. Okay. Who's ready to press play for the video? Well, I think all TA presidents should get a card. The old way, you have to, to follow where the proposal went to, who signed this and that. But now with this, you just have to put in your proposal to the TPA unit and then it goes through there but you're able to track it and it's easy. The purpose of tenant participation activity funds is to promote resident involvement and participation through the resident association of their development. So in 2017 we introduced the resident association commercial card. We use our TPA funds for holding meetings um, events that we might have. This process for us is much quicker, right? Because um, we do a budget and because I used the card and didn't have to go through the procurement process, I didn't have to pay more. In signing up for the card, we can come to you at your development and offer training there on site or you can come to NYCHA's offices. Good morning. I know I only have three minutes, but I'm speaking to everybody in this room. I'm a professional organizer, though I was told this morning when I ran in to make copies at my job that I was here representing myself. That's what nonprofits do. They take money out of the public housing community. They host all kind of trainings. But when it's not, not done by the tenants for the tenants, it doesn't work because then I have to give up my valuable time taking care of their business first before we could get to my business, and by that time, the tenant is tired. They're tired of being trained, they're tired of running around to 99,000 meetings and getting nothing in return. So that's how I'm gonna start this off. Secondly, I wanna say to everybody in this room who's been a TA president more than two years or two terms, you should be ashamed of yourselves. You should be nurturing young people in your community to take your roles over and to advance our communities further. 
but that's not happening because y'all don't know how to relinquish control. Thirdly, the stuff you just showed on there, I've been going to resident council since 1996. I even ran three times against a corrupt election process. But guess what? That's not what the tenant manual tells the tenant leaders to be doing in their communities. Number one, it says you have to follow the bylaws. I've been complaining that the bylaws are uh, antiquated, old. They've been set up since 1995 in my community with no one looking at them or revising them uh, since 1995. That's a violation of HUD 964 rule, which says you have to look at those bylaws every three years. I have a package here. I'm not going to try to read it, Alika, because it is lengthy. But know that the one that I sent to HUD, to Lynn Patton, is three times as thick because I'm tired of playing games here. Tenant association is supposed to be educating the tenants on things like this, public housing. How many people do we have? How do we build power? I've been going to tenant association for 30 years and it don't happen. So I went and started working for a nonprofit so I can uh, uh, hold those type of workshops. When we have red and infill going on in our community and you only come and tell us when you get to our development, that's not due process. So we went and we created uh, uh, graphs to show where the public housing in our community fits in with all of this affordable housing, which isn't affordable to most New Yorkers. They fit at the 30% range, which means they would be paying about $600 to $700 a month in rent. That used to be good rent in New York a few years ago. Unfortunately, in public housing, people like me are paying over $1,000, and then I don't have money for food, I don't have money for clothes, I don't have money for my grandchildren. This is sad, because I pay a good dime for public housing and in taxes. So I'm not going to sit here and take up all your time, but public housing needs to run using the bylaws and the rent and the TPA guidebook and all of the activity that they doing, candy, hot dogs and hamburgers, ain't got nothing to do with what the regulations in HUD 964 says they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be hosting the workshops that I got to go give my life to a nonprofit to host. Thank you. You're welcome. Good day, City Hall Council. Um, I was going to give a special hello to Miss Catherine Garcia. I assumed she was going to be here, but she's not here. Um, my name is Crystal Glover, and I'm a resident at Washington Houses, um, East Harlem, uh, representing myself, because Manhattan South, there is no representation. CCOP doesn't even smell us, more or less look at us. The CCOP meaning Council of Presidents, okay? But Ms. B, I will give you a special shout out. I think her name is Linda B. She testified at a um, March 11th hearing, told everything that needed to be told. Um, getting back to me. I found out about tenant participation activity funds back in November 2011. I was just elected for president at Washington Houses. That which was called community operations then is now called resident engagement. Resident engagement didn't share TPA fund information with me. I found out about it while in a conversation with a consultant from the Share for Life program in 2012. From that point forward, my board and I started going to leadership conferences, meeting with Organizations like the National Low Income Housing Coalition and the National Alliance for Resident Services in Affordable and Assisted Housing, just to name a few. We flew to different states, meeting many resident association leaders. In 2018, as part of Next Generation NYCHA, in partnership with the Fund for Public Housing in CUNY, a resident leadership academy was launched. I was told $145,000 was spent, uh, that the housing, uh, public housing committee spent on this program. 
When NYCHA's resident engagement asked me to become a student, I declined. I said to myself, did any of them consult the residents before creating this academy to see if it was even needed? Considering the hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of, dollars, of TPA funds spent on leadership conferences, flying all over to different states, uh, why didn't they get the residents' opinion first? Surely that money could have been spent on cameras, cameras for at least one development, the 145,000 I'm talking about. Uh, surely you'd like to know what my point in bringing all that up is? The point is, residents are no better off now than we were back then. You talk about federal monitors, was anybody monitoring the progress of TPA funds to ensure the residents would become self-sufficient and are becoming the leaders that they are intended to be? The federal monitor and Lynn Patton need to visit every NYCHA development that claims to have a resident association and conduct an open meeting, not one just for resident associations and their boards. Many tenant leaders for many years have withheld information from their residents, and residents have told me that when they ask questions at monthly meetings, police have been called on them. Membership is supposed to have privileges according to the bylaws. I pay my dues. I want to be included in the planning of activities at my development. Many RIA leaders don't even abide by the rules of their bylaws, and be because residents show no enthusiasm or concern, some boards stay on for many years. Unless HUD wants to continue throwing good money away, I suggest they do what I ask. They could have these open meetings borough by borough. The, op the unfortunate thing is that there is a changing of the guards, meaning the chairperson, every five minutes and so forth. In the words of uh, Fulani, the attorney, NYCHA is kicking residents' butts and she is 100% right. To conclude, to all the residents have tried, that have tried to make developments where they live a safer and better place to live, for all the heartache, misunderstandings, looking the other way, lies, sleepless nights, suffering and diseases brought on by stress and even death, I, Crystal Glover, salute you. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lalif Lozano. I come before you today in three capacities as treasurer of the Citywide Council of Presidents, um, as the resident and chair of Bronx North Association of Resident Councils, and finally as president of Parkside Resident Council. Given the amount of time available to me, I will summarize the points that go to heart of our position. I applaud the rumor that NYCHA's TPA funds will be forensically audited, but it must be said that any audit must go back to the beginning of TPA distribution and must include both the 60 given to the resident associations and the 40 held back by NYCHA. The failure of NYCHA to negotiate an MOU with CCAP rests on the shoulders of resident engagement and the community engagement division that its failure is in the direct violation of 964 regulations. NYCHA's attempted to subvert the good faith negotiation process with CCAP by imposing MOUs on individual resident associations under the implied threat that failure to sign what was present would result in denied access to TPA funds. None of these MOUs were negotiated. They were imposed on us. NYCHA reversed the process in place for decades and gave a meaningful role to CCAP and DCAP in the approval of TPA requests, determined that NYCHA should serve as only the approval authority for TPA requests. This was done to diminish the roles of CCAP and DCAP and done to impose the arbitrary, arbitrary will of NYCHA on the legit desires of resident associations. NYCHA further subverted the role of CCAP and DCAP and decided that resident associations could opt out of contributing to the budget of their district in order to deprive the districts of physical, fiscal capacity to engage in district-wide training, which we used to provide, Councilwoman, that we can no longer provide because we literally are starving 
because of uh, resident engagement, because they are dysfunctional. Um, Niger, in addition to failing to negotiate in good faith, adopted TPA guidelines and treats them not as guidelines, but as mandatory regulations binding on associations while avoiding both the regularity and the procurement process. NYCHA violates 964 and New York law by taking the position that they have the power to determine the content of organization you know, bylaws. NYCHA takes the position that if by bylaws are not certified by NYCHA, then they cannot be used and the TPA money can therefore be withheld. The word certified does not exist in 964 regulations. 960, um, NYCHA violates 964 arbitrarily regulating the electoral process of the non-for-profit resident associations and refusing the certified elections not conducted in the manner dictated by NYCHA and then withholding TPA funds for lack of certification. Again, I repeat, the word certified does not exist in 964 regulations. Niger violates HUD procurement policy by arbitrarily denying blackballing certain vendors who provide trading aim at empowering resident leadership. And Niger violates HUD procurement policies by arbitrarily denying certain types of programs authorized by 964 and chosen by association leaders on arbitrarily and suspicious grounds. More importantly, NYCHA has violated HUD and NYCHA's procurement regulations by artificially imposing a 5,000 micro-purchase requirement on resident associations, thereby requiring all bids in excess of 5,000 to have three bids, while the threshold for New York City is 20,000 and the federal threshold is even higher. Um, with all that being said, I have been doing this for over 30 years, and I just, I just have to honestly say that, you know, all of us resident leaders, we put our heart and soul. We don't get paid to do what we do. We do it because we take pride in where we live, and we do it because someone has to. We, we have to do something to affect change and improve our quality of life. But it's just very disheartening that NYCHA has just literally have, have bullied us to the point that we, we, can't, we can't produce anything and we can't provide anything to our resident associations, no our community. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good morning, Chair Samuels. I, uh, I come before you, my name is Robert Hall, I'm from Gun Hill Houses in the North Bronx. I come before you in my 17th year as a TA president, okay? I have before me testimony. I was told by the present, uh, the present resident engagement crew that the 964s and the TPA funds were distributed from 2006 up until the present. I've just provided information that I have before you, all right? And you can email me. I have information that I was given from Jerry Lamb who taught and trained me with regards to TPA. I have gone to meetings since 2002 and I was given pieces of paper and I have it, you can look it in your testimony. These are the amounts that were due to the individual housing developments in Bronx North. And for some reason, the present people who run resident engagement have no inkling of this money that exists since 2002. They can tell you about 2006 on. I was appalled when I was told that what I was talking about was embarrassing, all right? They need to understand they're violating the 964 regs because NYCHA, as well as CCOP, are supposed to get together and come up with an admirable plan of action with regards to these TPA funds. Since 2012, all that has happened on the campus of the New York City Housing Authority is NYCHA dictating and controlling these funds, when in fact they're only the custodian of these funds. 
This is wrong, it's inhumane, and everyone has problems with the philosophy that's been presently created by NYCHA, all right? In Bronx North, what we did is we educated ourselves on the process, and we took some of our experienced people, and we put them in charge of all the procurement aspects. Then we sent the, uh, all of the proposals out. For some reason, NYCHA finds something wrong with every proposal and or the consultants that we want to utilize. They are monopolizing our way of life as far as freedom of using our TPA funds and something has to be done immediately, if not sooner. I thank you. Thank you and thank you so much for your testimony. Um, now we'll switch out to the, do you have a question at all? Yeah, okay. So now we'll switch to our second panel. Thank you. And we've just been joined by our newest member of the committee who returned to the committee, Council Member Vanessa Gibson. The next panel will be Lisa Kenner, Daryl Burgess, Lorraine Stevens, and Clara Woods. And we're also being joined by member, council member Carlos Menchaca. And you had several people ask about you first thing this morning. So now you are no here. This thing is And just a reminder, we are on the clock. We have a significant number of residents who would like to testify this morning. You can begin. Good morning. My name is Lisa Kenner and I am the TA president of Van Dyke Houses. Like the young man said, he's been the president for 17 years. I've been the president for 17 years and I've been training people, but nobody wanna step up and do the job. I wanna sit down. At the end of this month, I'll be 60 years old. I started this journey when I was like 24. And believe me, you wanna sit down, but you can't sit down because if you don't have nobody to fight for where you live at, everything fall apart. Now, I, I seen that little commercial they made because I like the commercial card. You know, you don't have to run around with these, these um, receipts. You download the receipts. I had to learn. I'm still learning. Um, but, it's, but the thing about what I like is that the city don't have control of the TPA funds. They had control over the TPA funds back in 2003 and the administration that was in, in there is not here. At that time, it was Hugh Spence. I gotta keep it real. I went to Hugh Spence, I said, Hugh Spence, um, how come we can't spend our money? Like, oh, you gotta go do your citywide chair. At that time, the citywide chair was, you know who? I don't wanna mention his name, because I don't want nobody to sue me. Um, but everybody know. You have to run down the person to get the proposal signed. So why should I have to go to somebody else that don't live in my development, don't know what my people need to go sign a proposal? It didn't make no sense. You asked for the budget, the breakdown. You can't even get a breakdown. The last time when it first started back in 2003, I think Van Dyke had $238,000. Then when we asked for the budget, you're supposed to have a breakdown of the budget from the um, district. Never got it. I have a letter that I have written to our district chair, which he was the citywide chair. Where's the budget at? I think this is better for each control be done at where they live at. This way you know and you have the accountability what's going on. You know, um, 
like I said, I have to call it like I see because Hugh Spence at that time, I went all the way down there to ask him. He said, oh, you got to go see your chair. Well, I got to go see my chair, and I'm out here fighting to make sure my residents have a decent, clean, and safe place. And we don't get paid. I mean, a stipend, a stipend $100, and you be working, I do seven days a week. Sometimes I can't get up and go to church. I told my pastor, I said, Reverend Johnson, I'm on the highways and byways because Jesus wasn't in church all the time neither. He was on the highways and byways. And that's how I got away with it yesterday because I was preparing for this. So I just say that this part that I think everybody's accountable and you see and you can see it, that it shouldn't go back to citywide. You know, we should have a say because we don't give no money to the district because he don't provide no breakdown. How many give keep giving you money to the district and you don't provide a breakdown? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Daryl Burgess and I'm the resident leader for the Ingersoll Houses in Brooklyn. Uh, I also agree with Ms. Kenna when it comes to TPA activity. And the commercial card has been a big help to us at Ingersoll. We're a 501c3 organization, and proposed activity and expenditure must meet TPA eligibility, and proposed submission must have required supporting documents to avoid approval and process delay. The commercial credit card was introduced to Ingersoll, and it has become easy to use, and it lets us integrate the commercial card data into a, an accounting system. The smart data provides a workflow-based expense management solution, which enables us to better administer expenses. It is an intelligent management tool for optimizing business, spending with, spending with user IDs, passwords, and security control questions. It helps in accessing our organizational, organizational information. Upon submittal of TPA proposals, we receive a response within 10 business days. We follow our TPA guidebook, funding agreement template, and annual spending plan. The funds may be used at the citywide district or local levels in collaboration with residents and NYCHA. Once a purchase is made, we scan the receipts into the smart data where they are uploaded, reviewed, and saved. Through this process, resident associations have access to utilizing the funds for the benefit of NYCHA residents and communities. Our resident engagement coordinators are always available for me for assistance. And again, I have a big development and we do not contribute to the district level because um, that funding is for our development and we're at a state in our development where we have to go out and do everything, encouraging our youth Getting our youth involved is a hard task. In fact, they're faced with many peer pressure and they're faced with a lot of gang activity. So we come up with different resources using our MAP engagement coordinator to better fit our communities. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lorraine Stevens. I'm from Boulevard Houses. I'm the financial secretary. And as far as the TPA commercial card, we at Boulevard, we really like the card because it benefits us. We're able to do whatever we need to do as far as concerning the residents. It's very helpful and it's convenient. And like uh, we, once we do our purchases, we upload it and we are good to go. And if it's anything that needs to be taken care of, we take care of it. Our resident coordinator, she's always available to help us in any shape, form, or fashion. And we, our tenants, it helps us to help our tenants more efficiently to provide programs and activities for our youth and our seniors. And we um, would like to say on record that we support the TPA program the card because it's it's easier than going through any other channels this way we put our proposals in and once it's approved we are good to go we have had no problems with it and like I said once 
we do what we do. Our residents are happy, we're happy, and it keeps us focused, and we know exactly how much money we have to work with. And I just want to say again that we really support this program, and we hope that it stays in place. Thank you. Thank you. But um, one second. We have a few seniors that are up against the wall, and so um, I just want to make sure that we can Thank you. Okay. There are a couple of chairs, a couple of seats in the second row. Oh, it's not that much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So you know how we do in church. <laughs> if there are any young people or men that are able-bodied that could get <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Good morning, I'm from Boulevard Houses. I'm the president of Boulevard Houses. Um, I'm finding that the card that we have is very helpful to us because it helps us keep account of how our money is being spent and what is the balance of our money. Not only that, through using the card, we are able to keep a paper trail on everything that we do and everything that we spend. It allows us to build a folder of everything that we use. Not only that, I am very happy with the coordinator, Ms. Jacqueline Howard, because she has helped me and my board to walk through the process of knowing how to use the card, how to write proposals, how to get in other organizations to come in to help us in our development as far as health, health issues and different things that we need, organizations for our children to come in, daycare programs and different things that we need to bring into our development through us having a coordinator every month when we have a meeting, a cluster meeting, she brings in information for us that we normally don't get from NYCHA. If we don't get it from our cluster meetings, we don't find out about it. So I'm very happy and grateful for the cluster meetings because it helps us to find out what's going on inside of NYCHA that us as TA presidents, that NYCHA does not volunteer that information to us. So we find those, those informations out through the cluster. Another thing that I am happy for is that our coordinator comes out to our office to help us if we're having any type of problems with downloading, receipts or anything dealing with the computer because I'm not computer savvy. So I've had to as a, learn all of this and I'm grateful because I've been guided through the process step by step. And when it was the other way, we had to keep running down here to 90 church uh, to, to find out who to, to sign this paper. If that person wasn't in, it was held up for weeks at a time. And sometimes we were running into occasions and affairs that we had to have that we couldn't get our documents signed and approved on time. So through us having resident engagement, some of that has been avoided. So I'm grateful for the smart card and I'm grateful for the information that I was taught how to go about using it, writing proposals, and becoming more active. And it takes up less time with us being able to explain what we're learning to our residents. So I'm grateful, I just wanna thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And now we're gonna hear from the third panel. Any questions at all? I have a question. Okay, one second. One, one minute. Sorry, can you hold on a minute? Can you hold on a minute? One second. We have questions. Um, could you, any of you, explain what the um, the outreach was when 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 NYCHA started this program? 
there was a series of meetings throughout the city with NYCHA resident association leaders. How engaged did you feel in that process? Did you feel like you were being told that this was gonna happen? Did you, did you feel like you were a part of the planning decision uh, committee? Did you feel like you were adequately engaged? I, obviously, you, th this panel is very, uh, I guess, accepting of this new pro uh, process, but how, how could you walk us through the engagement part of it? I think a meeting was, it was been so long ago, time to do so much, but I think a meeting was called at 90 Church Street. I think they had a meeting or something that was talking about putting out the plan. Um, and I felt good because in the district, in the district where we live at, he wasn't doing this, teaching us this. So they were going to come along and teach this, and you have to pick up and grasp what things are right and what things are wrong. And I just want to give a shout out to Ms. Howard because she sure enough helped me. Because I don't know nothing about no downloading. She, I taught something, learned something new. So I didn't give the shout out before, but I, she has helped. That was a part of the process that I think they called you in and was talking about it. Then you have every month you go to the cluster meeting. There's always something different to learn. Um, and we have a lot of seniors, and you know a lot of seniors don't know about computers. And she has come out, and you set up appointments, she'll come out. If she's not doing paperwork at her office, she'll come out and help you on the computer. Because she sure enough taught me how to scam some receipts. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, I know that's a, that's, that was one of the hardest part of the process, but when you were having the conversation about transferring over to the card system, did someone say to you, hey, you know, we don't, we don't really think that the old system is working or it's, it's a little bit antiquated and we wanna, you know, modernize it a little bit and we think that if you go into a card system, it'll probably be easier for you to uh, make purchases and uh, keep a better tr uh, track of what, how you're spending your money. What do you think about that? Did anybody ever ask you that? Or were you simply brought into a room and told, this is a new way that, you know, this is where NYCHA is heading, we're moving away from the old TPA system and we're heading, you know, uh, south. Is that's, that what happened? That's the way they was telling you that this is the way, you know, NYCHA's is heading to a different way. It wasn't that they told you, do you want to do it? They didn't ask. They told you that this is the way they, they roll it. Just like when they had the community centers. Nobody asked us, did we want to give up our community centers? You know, they just took the community centers. And our community is, all our community is suffering. Like DYCD came in, that's the worst thing you ever done. You know, but they, they didn't tell access, they told us. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I can't lie for them. Mm -hmm. okay. you good? Thank you, and I, and I appreciate that, actually. Mm -hmm. It's really important that we get all the information. Well, we'll, 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 stand, with, we'll stand with you. We'll, we'll definitely stand with you. Ms. Howard, may, I'll ask you this question. Uh, I'm Ms. Woods. Ms. Howard is back there. Oh, Ms. Howard. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, what was your name? Clara Woods from Boulevard House. Woods. Boulevard. Well, when they came to us, they set up in different locations and different centers, and they came out, and they started talking to us about the card. And at that time, some of us did not want to change over to the card because we didn't understand. Right. And we were being told that we had to. We didn't really have a choice. Right. Well, and I want to. I want to pick up on that because that there, there's a couple themes. There's a couple things that are, have been consistent mm -hmm. in terms of uh, wanting more support, wanting more understanding and relationship with NYCHA, mm -hmm. and and I think there's another component to this. There's another side that's the relationship with the tenants on the side, and people that can support you in leadership, and. I, I kind of want to get a sense about how how you then turn to the community and say, I, I need I need your support. Can I engage with a maximum amount of people? And so what then do you do as a leader to bring more people to the table, to engage more people? How do you measure that? How do you track that? Well, every month in my development, I have a meeting. And whatever information that I collect about NYCHA from the cluster meetings or any other meetings that we go to to bring back, I bring back information to my residents and literature to my residents so that they can read up on 
what's going on as well as what I'm finding out, I bring it back to them. So those meetings I, are, are really important. Those to, meetings okay. are very important. So tell in me a little bit about so, and I'm going to walk you through a few questions so we can get to the next panel. But uh, I have meetings too in the district, and not everybody comes to even my meetings as a city council member with a larger group of people. And so I'm I'm continually frustrated and but also trying to figure out ways to engage more people. And so I, I don't know what it is in your development, and in Red Hook, there's a lot of challenges there too. A few people come uh, with a group of eight, 10,000 people living in a development, 15, 20 people will come. And so help me understand how beyond those meetings you can engage more people, because here's the question, these dollars are important to impact many people. We heard about the young people. We heard about seniors. Mm. There's so many different populations. We haven't even talked about immigrants who don't speak English, who need translation. And so there's all these barriers. And so I kind of want to get a sense. For, I'm, I just asked you, but if anybody has any more things to say about that, that, that's one of the other questions that can help build power to demand more from NYCHA. But you can't have one without the other. While we bring out speakers, with literature that comes to our development that can speak to our tenants and explain to them what is going on. Every month we have different people from different agencies to come out to our meetings to speak to our tenants. Thank you. Thank can, you. Can thank you. I want to get very hard. It's hard. Say, it's hard. Let, you know, sometimes people don't read the flyers. What I learned to do, I purchase a sound system. I go to mm -hmm. the street. People listen more than they read. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what I find to be affected. I started off with a bullhorn, now I carry this thing and a mic and stuff like that so people can hear. Also, you know, we have people that don't speak English. Mm -hmm. I have a person that speaks Spanish, because I only speak a little bit. So I have to have somebody with me who speak Spanish because um, this way they understand. And I find that by having that person, I get more Hispanic people to come to the meetings, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I think, like you said, people don't come to your, um, your meetings. Maybe you need to ride around in the car and put a sound system up here. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and we're always trying to do that. And that, that's, a, that's a difficult thing. The last comment I wanna make is, I also heard that, that you're volunteers and there's a small stipend. And that's not easy, so there's a lot of pressure on you to do this work without any kind of professionalism that also requires more responsibility and accountability for you and your meetings and how, making sure that you register people who are coming in to really have a track record and transparency of your meetings. That all takes professionalism and, and I think that's what I'm hearing more, that we need to push as we look at TPAs, how do we professionalize these councils so that the term limits and all the things that are required get followed so that you can have the most robust opportunity to communicate to the most people uh, and bring and get more empowerment but for, for I, everyone, young the, and our elders. But let me just say this to you because a lot of people have this um, interpretation about the people in public housing. Um, yes, you do professionalism, but I went to college. I may live in public housing, I went to college. I got a BS in public administration, mm -hmm. okay? You may not think it, but I do. Yep. And with my knowledge from the school I went to, and with the knowledge that I learned from them, picking up from different, even from different presidents. I may live in Brooklyn. Yep. I know presidents in the Bronx, in Manhattan. I keep them connect. I just don't know presidents in Brooklyn. You know, I know what's going on in Manhattan, the Bronx. I had Mr. Toplin call me from Manhattan, somewhere or the Bronx, but I know he's up there, he don't live in Brooklyn. Right. But the thing is that people have to realize, not everybody may went to college, but people got common sense. And as a president or a leader, you have passion where you live at. Right. I don't want housing to fall down, because if housing falls down, where I'm going? That's right. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to move down south. I ain't got nothing against down south. That's right. But I know one thing, in New York, I can catch a bus or subway any time of the night. Right. You know, um, but it just have to be, I just know that the administration have to be more sit down and talk and communicate 
and don't think that we less than people, mm -hmm. right. okay? It's um, respect, you're asking for respect. Because if it wasn't for the residents, they wouldn't have no job. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of them making six figures and we only making $100 a month. Well, and that's, I guess, what I'm saying. But think, I, I'm gonna have to, okay. this, is, this is a lot. Thank you. And um, I do appreciate, I, I'm gonna say this, I do appreciate the dialogue because again, when we come into these hearings, we only hear from the administration, from the agency, then they leave or con you know, continue to have somebody there and then we hear from the public. This is an opportunity to be able to hear from the residents, hear what's going on, and then have NYCHA respond to that. But we do have to make sure that we hear from everyone because we've already been in this hearing for one hour and so we still have seven more mm -hmm. residents to speak. And so thank you so much thank for your testimony and we're gonna call on the next um, group Audrey Clemens, Diana Blackwell, Ronald Topping, and we have been joined by Council Member Richie Torres. Thank you for being here. Madam Chair, our lady, can I ask you a question? Can you ask me a question? Sure. While they're getting settled, you want to ask yeah. me a question? No, you, you just said that the purpose of this meeting is for the resident to come and for NYCHA to respond. Yes. Is there anyone from NYCHA here today? All NYCHA's here. Who's NYCHA? <laughs> They're testifying after, they, we, no, we're listening to I, them I'm after. Talking about, about, I'm talking about NYCHA, someone from NYCHA that could make decisions. Yes, so the executive vice president okay. is here. Okay. Okay. And just a reminder that we're on the clock. Thank you, Ms. Blackwell. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'll say again, good afternoon, Chair Samuel and honorable council members. Uh, before I begin, I just want to give a shout out to my zone coordinator, who is absolutely wonderful. I have to say, they sent her, she really didn't have a lot of knowledge. I kind of beat her up, but she's fine now. She's excellent now, <laughs> so I really appreciate that part. But I, I'll start again. My name is Diana Blackwell, and I'm president of Fred Samuel City Development. I'm here to testify to what I consider a failed system for NYCHA TPA when using the commercial card and the digitized proposal for funds request. Being that I'm a natural uh, progressive person, I believe that I was one of the first resident leaders to sign on an agreement to use the commercial card. I believe that this card would be an asset to the leaders, being that we could purchase our own products in a timely manner while providing each leader with a slight savings in our budget. This proved not to be true in every case. The proposal process with its new form proved to be a failure also. Being digitized should have made it a simpler process. It did not. Mistakes were made on the form, new instructions were added, but the form was not updated or corrected to reflect these items. At cluster meetings, these adjustments were spoken of, but nothing happened. The process takes up to 10 business days while going through multiple hands and can be delayed even longer if a mistake is made and or one person is out and there's no coverage. Furthermore, since the last postponement of this hearing, NYCHA's resident engagement was able to add to the handbook there are new tip sheets, additional instructions, and our updated budget for each development. As for me, I have a personal grievance that after following the rules and submitting my per diem request for a September conference, I never received the per diem. I tried unsuccessful for weeks to conclude this matter with resident engagement, but to no avail. We are still waiting for our reimbursement. Today in our new tip sheets, they now state that this will be one of the items that NYCHA will still handle with a note that it may, but the note is that it may take longer than usual. But six months waiting, there's much more, but I'm going to yield my time 
And I would like to say, due to the time constraint, I have limited my testimony, but will follow up with a subsequent le letter. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm the president of PS 139, Senior Building in S Central Harlem. Can you just state I'm your name? today to voice my concerns. Just state, just state oh. your name. All right, any? Your name. Okay. Audrey Clemens. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm here today to voice my concern about the new commercial car that we are now using in NYCHA for TPA. To begin, I don't like the new system because it is hard to use. It's just not friendly to seniors. When I shop with the car, that's okay, instead of someone else shopping for me. But once you get the card, if you don't use it in a certain amount of time or forget to write down your password, then you must try to get in contact with natural commercial car staff. And they are not quick to respond. When I must turn in the receipts, this is very difficult because I do not know how to use the computer well enough to do this, even though I, I have taken up computer classes. Instead of not taking the receipts for us, we must scan them and save them. I don't understand how to scan. I must seek help each time for my proposal and receipts. Not to say that we must scan them within five days, and sometimes I have no help to do this. Then I am locked out and have trouble getting back in. In order to turn in our receipts, there's a long process that has almost 12 steps. And I have tried to understand how to do this, but it is hard. In conclusion, I will say again that this new system is hard to use, especially for us seniors. There should be a choice of which way we place our orders and not be forced to do it in a new way. This system we do not know since this is not what our generation grew up on. We only use the computers for family, fun, and things. Mm -hmm. this, is what, this is what a paid person used to do at NYCHA, and now we are doing it for free. Thank you. Peace and grace. Good, uh, good morning. Thank you, Council, for allowing us as tenant leaders to come in and speak. We finally arrived at Holy Week, followed by Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday. Amen to the, all of that. Uh, I want to I start off by saying that um, there's a couple of talking points I have here. Um, I'd like to know what is the legal justification for signing up for a commercial card that there is no place that rule in HUD that says that we have to do that. If we don't sign up for it, we're being forced to told that you're not gonna be able to have access to your TPA money. To me, that sounds like controlling. It's not their money, it's the tenant association participatory funding. That's where that money belongs. That's what resident leaders have guides to work and have that sort of stuff. They have no justifications for that. When it comes time to get monies for things like our internet service where we have to upload cards, there is no uh, monies being paid out in advance for our services. If you don't get a proposal in on time, when it comes time for you to get those um, uh, internet services paid, they cut your service off. If you got um, stuff that you purchased, you're not able to upload, you can't run to the library, they give you 45 minutes. So then you turn around and you're stuck with having your money shut down because you can't upload a receipt. How ridiculous is that when there's money in your account, whether it be allocated money, Money or reserve money. You understand? Th th these are the problems that, 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 that we, we're dealing with. When it comes to HUD, provides $25 per dwelling unit, and NYCHA takes $10 out of the 25. Most cities in the North Hills of America only take 
Less than 40%. HUD says take up to 40%. They take the entire 40%, say they're going to use it for administrative courses and provide services. They provide these little winky dink trainings um, for us overloading, handing us literature and expect us to know what to do. People learn from different ways. They learn from hands-on. They learn from visual. They learn from a variety of sources. If you don't have these opportunities available to people and have a little bit more flexibility, you're going to have series of problems of people not doing. We are penalized once again. Again, you're controlling our TPA funds. The, the clim invent to, of cluster meetings throughout all though, they, the ideas were good. The meetings causes too much confusing, mistrust among the resident association presidents and the executive board members, which seems to cause a division, divide and conquer is what they're doing in this atmosphere. That needs to stop. We have many concerns as to what kinds of messages are being transmitted to our executive board. They need to understand, you talk to me. I'm going to be responsible. I related to the message board. When you come in, you come in. We work for free. You get paid. We do this job because we care for our communities. We care for our people, and we love where we live. You can't tear us down you, with a, a bulldozer. You have to blow us up and get, a, and get us out. That's the way we get out. NYCHA has no longer allowed us to use the tax-exempt certifications to purchase that's made with TPA funds, but with the same breath we are told that tax supplies or purchases, they must pay for them out of their own pockets. Once again, we do not get a paycheck. Without out-of-town with, with out travels, with the per diems for uploading on the commercial cards, as you just heard earlier, some get them on time, some don't. Um, there is no accountability for real records of true funding that participates in development. Also, NYCHA states that the funds on the card were to reach destinations of funds available for resident leaders to end the up using of their own services and to meet the car services. Uber, we can't use the card with Uber. I mean, come on, what do we got the card for if we have limitations? Can't go to Costco's. All of these things that they are anticipating don't run in the South Bronx neighborhood. The green cabs don't want to go above 110th Street, so now we're fine using other services that's charging us more money on our cab services to get around. It doesn't make sense. That has to change. The purpose of the commercial card is flawed. It needs to be revised by total leadership. Once again, people, I want to say I thank you all for allowing us to express. There's a lot more to this. You, you, I, I can't tell you all what to do. Please don't be doing the text and listen to us and hear us. When you have a sit down with NYCHA, don't buy into their, what they are all saying. Listen to what we are saying. They have already taken what was once ours and taken 14 million, put it into a pot and disperse it. That's illegal. This is where the problem began. When they started doing something, you take from Peter to pay Paul, and Paul never got a paycheck. So what we finally need to do is understand how we can rectify that problem. Stop thinking that we're stealing because it's already been stolen. $17 billion have already been taken from us. We have no community centers. We have nothing. We have very little. This is why teleportation sometimes may be low. They are tired and, and, and weary, and they don't believe in the new leadership because we've already been beaten down by nature itself. I'm not even talking about mold. I'm talking about TPA. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Topping. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one last, we have one last panel. This is the last panel before NYCHA testifies. And we're going to need one more chair. Carmen Quiones, Princella Jamerson. Aixa Torres, <laughs> Margaret Masick, and Cipriani Noel. We need one more chair. One chair. Thank you.
And again, the reason why we have the testimony from the residents first is to make sure that your voices are heard and that we can have an actual real conversation, real discussion, real hearing with NYCHA based on what is said from the residents. Ms. Torres, we can start with you. Good morning, council members. My name is Aixa Torres, and I'm the resident association president of Alfred E. Smith Houses Resident Association Incorporated. Um, the history of the TPA funds in NYCHA in the past have been, if you have a godfather, you get, you get, your, you, you get baptized. However, with the card system, there's a, term, a transparency that never existed before. And even though there might be glitches and they still need to, like any new system, things need to be fixed, be fixed. But at the end of the day, the transparency that we now have with this card system never existed. You're speaking to a resident association that had to hire an attorney just to get, just to get certified with our election. Um, you're speaking to a resident association who um, tries very diligently to keep our residents informed. We try to do a lot of things. However, the way the TPA funds were being done when you wanted to buy something, I have translation equipment that I actually need desperately that have been sitting in the boxes because when I had to do the other system, the person who ordered from NYCHA didn't know what they were doing. Then they would come into the management office and sit there so by the time you got the things you ordered, there were no goods. They're still sitting in the box, brand new, sealed, because I haven't been able to use something that I desperately need for my residents to be informed, and that is their right. And my responsibility as president is not only to inform my executive board, but for every resident who lives in Alfred E. Smith houses. And I take this responsibility serious. No, we don't get paid. And I get that, but I chose to do this. Um, I'm retired now, so I have more time, but I just came from a retreat, and part of the reason we were able to do it with the executive board and my chair people of my committee, because we have several committees, was because we used the, the card, and I was able to find a place that was reasonable, do all the things that I needed to do to accommodate. Because now that we're incorporated, we not only have obligations to NYCHA and to everyone else, but we also have legal fiduciary responsibilities and everybody needs to know. So I am in favor of the program. Yes, something needs to be done. Um, and there might be things that fix. And I want to give a shout out to my coordinator, Denisha Wheeler, because she's done an excellent job of supporting and helping the people who use the card. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Margaret Masick. I'm an ex-treasurer for Oceanside. And I just would like to talk about some of the glitches in the card. Is one card to two people in the board. And only those two people can go to training about the card, which I think is wrong, because I think all the board members should be able to go to the trainings to be on one page. They shouldn't just make it to stickler for just those two people. Then the other thing with the card, the card had the name Oceanside on it. My name is not Oceanside. So when I go shopping, I have to kind of hope I get some kind of teenager uh, clerk or cashier that doesn't really care or have to talk them into using the card. Because when I went to transit to get um, Metro cards, they, they gave me the third degree, I needed this, I needed that because no matter what IDs I showed them, I have no NYCHA ID, and I even tried to get one. They told me they don't issue it. Because, and then it's like, Costco, when I applied for Costco and also for the bank card, it had Oceanside in, um, Incorporation and my name underneath. So I don't know why would NYCHA be cheap enough not to do that. Just a card with, you know, and some people, to truth be told, you have to, you can't always every place you go convince people that you are that person and then there are times where i use the card and the young person the cashier 
I guess I have a trusting face, didn't ask for no ID. So that means anybody could really use that card. So I think that's a huge flaw. And then there are places where, like I said, they won't give you, they won't, they're gonna give you a hard time to try to use it because your name is not on the card. Why would two people be able to use that same card? And I was told when I went to the training that you have to trust your board member. I'm like, I don't even trust my own sisters with my, you know, with my bank. How am I trust a board member? You know, they can do anything with the card and then my name and their name is, you know, whatever. It still goes back to you. It, it, yes, yeah, still can go back to me. I don't have money to be paying back anybody anything. And then, you know, um, it's really true. Anybody could use the card. Cause, uh, and it's, it's like really frightening um, that, because sometimes I had to, I was telling the president if he had the card, and I know he has people in his house that I, me, I can say I may not trust them. Suppose they take the card and do whatever, it still goes back to me. And I think that's, you know, that needs to be improved. And also, I am somewhat computer savvy, I am educated, and it took a while for me to learn the uploading thing. And, um, and I went to training twice, just, and I thank God I was able to go twice, and I think we can go even a little longer, and we need to know about this 20% giving money to be uh, a little bit more clear. Um, thank you so much. Good morning, my name is Priscilla Jameson. I'm the resident leader for Millbrook Houses. I'm here to talk about the commercial card. Um, the commercial card is way beyond most of the resident leaders' ability to work with. In order for some of the resident leaders to upload the receipts, the coordinators will have to come and help them through it. Once you get the card and you use it, they are telling resident leaders that they have 72 hours to upload the receipts. NYCHA is now moving June 1st, 2019 for the remainder of the resident leaders who would not want the card to take it. If they don't take the card, they will not be able to use TPA funds. I'm gonna give you an example of something that happened when I recently went for training for some of the people that came out there with the cards. They came out for training. They didn't have their per diem. They didn't have their um, money to um, put down in the hotel in order for them to get in the room. I forgot what you call it, but it's like you have to give them the card so that this way you'll be able to enter the um, room. There was no money on the card. Um, some residents couldn't even pay for the registration for the training. So I have a lot of concerns about the way NYCHA is moving so fast to get these cards in our possession. I have many concerns and I hope that y'all hearing our testimony that y'all would ask those questions of NYCHA, why are they moving so fast without proper training? Another thing I want to say, we need a total and full accounting of TPA funds. This must be done as soon as possible. We've been asking NYCHA for years for an accurate account of these funds, and we still hadn't received them. Recently, when NYCHA decided to revamp TPA, they took all of the money from the districts in the developments and they put it into one pot and then they split it up amongst all of the resident leaders development. There was resident leaders that had a whole lot of money in a TPA account that now you can't find it. It's missing by thousands of dollars. So the next problem is with, resident, with the resident engagement department. There's a total lack of communication and non-responsiveness of the department. So in other words, if they are not happy or pleased with you, you get no call back. And I wanna also say that my coordinator, Miss Alina Williams, really comes out and try her best to help the resident leaders. 
Thank you. Okay, is this on? Is it on? Yeah, it's on. First, let me say thank you um, for having the CPA meeting, um, or rather forum, I call it, because um, we've been waiting, actually. I was kind of upset that it was canceled twice, um, because I believe that everyone in this room has been waiting a long time to talk about TPA. I don't use the card. I don't have the card. Um, I never signed, well, I signed the agreement now, but I have not used any of the money. First of, and foremost, when I became president, actually, almost five years ago, um, they gave me a budget. The budget said $252,000, right? Then the following uh, year, I got another budget. It was 89000 Now you do the math. I am not, I, my, as, as I want to know where that money went. First of all, in my development, every apartment is accountable. You count every apartment, that's how the TPA monies are gotten. So how would you take my money and give it to another development? That's illegal, and it needs to be looked into. Now, if they took that type of money from me, I want you to add it up. Add it up by all of the developments. We're talking about billions of dollars. Where is that? Um, I really can't talk to you about how the card works and how the card doesn't work. I'm, qu I'm quite sure that I'm capable of working the card, working everything that, that I need to do. But that's not the issue. The issue is, is that this is a dictatorship, and it cannot happen. How can you dictate to us when you're supposed to oversee only? Um, even, even our consultants are attacked, um, and I'm talking in general, okay? If we want someone to represent us um, as a council, um, they have something to say. If this is, in fact, my development, I know what's going on, I want my own council. You don't have to say who, who does it or not. That's not your business. We, are, we should be allowed to have representation. And there's always a problem when you get it. Either they don't like him or they do like him. Now, another thing, TPA and a lot of the presidents. Listen, this is, uh, uh, this is a dictatorship instead of a democracy. Um, we have a lot of presidents that are on the side of NYCHA. Why? Y'all need to investigate that, okay? Y'all really need to investigate that. But then we have real presidents, like the ones that sit here and tell you the truth. All right? But all of this re it is just a real big dictatorship. Um, and in, I would love to see the partnership come back. There was a time when we were partners with New York City Housing Authority, when we were respected as leaders. We were included in the process. I don't know where it broke down, but we need to get back to that because we need to be partners. We can't keep fighting each other, but you gotta know that these leaders that, like they said, they don't get paid, you need to start respecting. You come in my development, respect me because we're on the ground. Our skin, our sweat, is in our developments, not anyone else. Our caretakers are being misused. Their backs are breaking because they got more than one building. 20-story right. building. I got one woman in a 20-story building. I got two of my great men getting ready to go out. One has cancer, the other one has slipped this. I guess so, carrying all that garbage by yourself, 20 floors. I'd have a slip this too. This whole thing is, is, is corrupt for real. It is really a corrupt system. 
and you really have to do an, a forensic audit, you got you, y'all guys got some jobs to do. And I'm gonna tell you, I love you guys, but if you don't do it, then you are not for us. Because we are tired, tired, tired. I've been in the trenches 30 years, 30 years, as a district leader, state committee woman, a liaison. I've worked for almost every elected official. Y'all need, we elect you guys, you need to represent us. Because I'm gonna tell you, if you don't represent me, I'm coming after you. That's real. I got 19 grandkids and five great grand. I ain't taking nobody's stuff. Enough is enough. The system is wrong. It's wrong. You're gonna hear people for it, and you're gonna hear people against it. The people that are for it got a vested interest. That's real. They got a vested interest. Everything needs to be investigated. Thank it's you. It's the only way. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Noel, you're the last resident to testify. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I we have been, one, we've been um, joined by Councilmember Van Bramer. Bring us home, Mr. Noel. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, pleasant good morning to everyone on the panel. Um, I'm just here simply just to um, testify my people. Um, my name is Cyprian Noel. I'm the TA president for Links and Hughes Development. Uh, I'm a very small development, three buildings. One of the, um, I don't have the TPA card. I don't have the card. I do um, proposal. One of the most frustrating thing is um, when you do the proposal, they keep rejecting it because they want you to spend the money on what they want them, what they want to do. But I, I take the position so I can fight for the people. I can be a, a voice for the people. I want, I, I hear what the people want. NYCHA don't know what the people want because they, they just come and work and they leave. The people in the development know, I know what they want because they talk to me. So when we do proposal to try to get, uh, to get the, the funding, they keep rejecting us because they're saying, oh, well, the funding is not for this, but it's for this. Why give us money and then tell us how to spend it? It don't make no sense. I'm, I'm a single father of four kids, and, and I, give them, I give my kids a stipend, and I tell them, you use this money for your, for your own. Whatever they spend the money on, I have to agree with it because I give it to them. You're giving us some funding, but you're telling me what to spend it on. I have, so, I have so much young people in my development and so much seniors. One of the things is I love to look out for my seniors. Um, we're trying to get cameras for that, and we're trying to um, make it better for the seniors. One thing, I, I really appreciate my seniors, but not getting what the seniors want. Um, we try to do some classes for the seniors, but they're telling me, no, we can't get funding for that because it's, it's not in the guidelines and all of that. But why give me the money? You know, and I, it, it's a frustrating, it's really a frustrating thing when you have to try to get money to, to fight for the people. Sometimes you have to use your own money. People tell me, you're crazy, you can't be doing that. But I'm not getting the money from, the, from, from the, you know, they're not giving it to me, so it's really frustrating. My thing is, I really want to see you all fight on behalf of the people, fight on behalf of the TA president. I'm a new president in office. I'm a new president in office. I could have just say, you know, um, just give up this thing and just take care of my four kids. But no, I want to see changes in development. I want to see my, my development look good. I, you know, and it takes money to, to make it happen. And it takes the people who went higher up to make it happen because as, as she just said, we vote, vote all in office. We expect to see some results. And I hope that this gen go to one air and come to the next. And then after all these beautiful testimonies and everybody crying and spilling their guts, then to go back to zero again where we just started all over. So I hope NYCHA is really listening to take heed to what we're really saying and to really act on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our resident leaders who, have, who took the time this morning to passionately testify on behalf of your residents. I just have one um, quick question for Ms. Torres. You mentioned that you had to hire um, a legal attorney in order to be able to assist with your election process. Can you just explain to us briefly why you had to hire outside counsel in order to help with your election? Because they, they didn't want me to be president. I mean, I, th it's not this administration, but the previous administration. I gave them hell. Okay. I mean, it's okay. I landed up in the OR room, but, you know, I gave them hell because it wasn't right what they were trying to do. But I did hi hire a legal team. We took NYCHA to court, and we won. And we held everybody accountable. I, 
I just find, I just find that the, with the TPA funds now that we have um, with the card, um, there's more transparency and there are guidelines that you have to follow, you know, and there are things that you have to do and, and, and everybody is held accountable. But we also have a spreadsheet that gives us a balance every quarter of how much money we spent, how we've spent it with lime items. That never happened before. Okay. You know, it was like what she's saying. One day, you know, you have this much money and then you turn around and you didn't have that money. Okay. It, it was crazy. And so there are glitches. They, there are serious glitches. Um, but they can be corrected, and that's all part of the process when you start a new program. Okay. 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 I, just, I just wanted some clarity on you having to hire legal counsel. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that everything that we've heard over the past hour and a half should lend to a very um, helpful discussion and hearing and testimony from NYCHA, and hopefully um, you can tweak your responses based on what we've heard from the residents. Okay. And we've been joined by committee members, council member Salamanca, and we've also been joined by council member Traeger. And is there someone birthday today? Happy birthday, council member Traeger. And thank you for spending your birthday with us. From NYCHA, we have David Preston and Sadia Sherman. And so you, you're gonna wait to be sworn in by counsel. Do you affirm, oops, there you go. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Chair Alika Amprey Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing and other distinguished members of the City Council. Good morning. I'm Sadia Sherman, Executive Vice President for Community Engagement and Partnerships at NYCHA. Joining me is David Priston, Executive Vice President for External Affairs. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss our work to empower residents by helping them access and use tenant participation activity funds. You just heard from some of our resident association leaders on their experience accessing TPA funds, and we appreciate their feedback. I'd first like to explain how TPA funding is allocated to NYCHA. TPA funds are governed by a federal regulation, 24 CFR 964.150, which stipulates how the funds are dispersed and used. In sum, HUD requires that every public housing authority set aside a specific portion of its federal operating subsidy for resident associations. These funds are, designed, are designated by HUD to be used for eligible tenant participation activities that engage residents in fostering a positive living environment. As part of our operating subsidy, these funds are subject to the same financial controls as the rest of our operating subsidy meaning that NYCHA must ensure accountability and oversight of their expenditure. These are taxpayer dollars that are intended for the public good. Some examples of eligible tenant participation activities include RA membership building activities, information dissemination, resource fairs, development cleanup days, educational classes and workshops, and the purchasing of office supplies. Travel for training, conferences, and seminars may be eligible as well. For example, at Tilden Houses, TPA funds supported a three-day legal conference for residents hosted by Brooklyn Legal Services. It covered topics such as reentry, following incarceration, and clearing one's record for employment. At Pominock Houses, TPA funds were used to purchase emergency go bags for residents participating in emergency preparedness workshops sponsored by the New York City uh, Emergency Management Office. TPA funding was established in the early 2000s. We reformed NYCHA's TPA program in 2016 as part of Next Generation NYCHA, our long-term strategic plan, and continue to make improvements to the process based on feedback from residents. 
When NYCHA last discussed this topic with the council in 2017, my colleagues committed to several actions that would improve the TPA funding process for residents. These included several processes and transparency improvements, and I'm pleased that we've accomplished the following since then. We've updated the written agreement between NYCHA and resident associations on the use of TPA funds based on comments from resident leaders and the city council, as well as input from the Legal Aid Society. That involves simplifying the agreement's language. We updated the plain language guidebook that accompanies the funding agreement, and this is available online. To help familiarize the council with the process and answer your questions, we hosted a webinar and briefed council members one-on-one -on -one as requested. We introduced a commercial card, which RAs use to make approved purchases up to $5,000 to streamline the purchasing process. For instance, RAs can buy office supplies at a local store without having to order them through NYCHA's procurement department. The card can be used for approved travel, making travel arrangements easier and faster, and for reoccurring bills like phone and internet. RAs can reconcile their spending through our online system, a process that promotes accountability and oversight. Currently, nearly 80% of RAs who are accessing funds are using the commercial card. We shared earlier today a video um, that showcases the commercial card, and that's available on the homepage of our NYCHA website. We created and posted online tip sheets on topics such as travel, budgeting, and accessing funds to help residents make the best use of their TPA funds. We also posted online quarterly budget reports that list the TPA funds spent and available by development so that RAs, residents, and the public have full uh, visibility on spending. Let me take a moment to give you an overview of the TPA funding process. HUD requires a written agreement between PHAs and RAs on the use of TPA funds. HUD also directs PHAs to provide residents with guidance on their, their use and, and the process. As I mentioned, we updated our guidebook to make the process clearer for residents. To access the funds, RAs submit spending plans on an annual basis. They submit separate proposals to determine eligibility for activities. TPA funds should benefit all residents. RAs should endeavor to include as many people in the activities as possible, as required by HUD's regulations. Again, all of this information is available online, and my office is always happy to answer questions or assist with the process. Last year, we processed over 1,500 TPA spending proposals. Our staff provides technical assistance to RAs to make sure expenses are eligible and to help with procurement issues. Each RA can also get support from one of NYCHA's 15 local resident engagement coordinators, in addition to support from the central office staff who administer the TPA funds. In accordance with HUD regulations on leadership building, we also host monthly cluster meetings to provide RA board members with updates on important and relevant topics. RA leaders select the topics of these meetings, and we host more than 30 per month. We also provide residents with tools that can help them use TPA funds to the maximum benefit for, of the community. For example, we surveyed seniors to identify their top priorities and have discussed the use of TPA funds to support their civic engagement projects. We also will launch a guide for using the funds on health programs. While resident engagement coordinators will work with RAs on identifying resources to support their efforts, it is ultimately the RAs that determine how to spend their development's TPA funds. Going forward, we are working with RAs to achieve 100% utilization of the commercial card by this summer. To minimize the administrative burden on RAs and NYCHA, we are improving our system for processing stipend payments, eliminating certain requirements for RAs to submit proposals for most small purchases, such as refreshments and office supplies, and consulting with HUD on other ways to streamline the process while still satisfying the regulatory requirements of the program. This means faster access of TPA funds for residents. Facilitating the TPA fund process, funding process is just one way that, our off, that we engage and support residents at NYCHA. Guided by our long-term strategic plan, the Community Engagement and Partnership Division works tirelessly to empower residents and resident leadership. In partnership with NYC, with NYC Service and Capital One, our 13 youth leadership councils are giving a, a youth a voice and a role in tackling their community's most pressing issues. Nearly 100 senior champion volunteers work with NYCHA and community members to engage their fellow seniors on health, safety, and educational projects. Thanks to support from the City Council and CUNY, our Resident Leadership Academy is helping establish and aspiring resident leaders take a more active role in their community, including their resident associations, 
through training and the cultivation of leadership skill, school, skills while earning college credits. These are just a few examples. Our team supports a host of other initiatives across the authority that help create safe, clean, and connected communities from services to seniors as well as entrepreneurship programs. TPA funds provide financial support to engage residents, bolstering NYCHA's work to force specifically engaged New Yorkers. TPA funds can be a powerful tool to improve resident quality of life. They're most effective when all residents are at the table and engaged. And our work with resident associations across the city, we've seen their impact and there's potential for even more. We welcome the council's feedback and partnership in working with the community so that more residents can help make a difference through the use of TPA funds. Thank you and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. So you've heard countless residents come and testify about their experiences with the TPA process, the commercial card usage. Some are extremely um, supportive of the process and feel it is helpful, and some have some serious concerns. Mm -hmm. And so um, it would be helpful, and just, just a couple of words that I heard during the testimony from the residents. I heard dictatorship, I heard mandatory rules, I heard forced to sign the agreement, and so um, that's very strong language, especially in the era of a new process. Mm -hmm. This has been reformed. And so clearly there are some serious issues that we need to discuss. So again, I'm thankful for the testimony that we had before. So just starting out, how much funds did NYCHA receive from HUD for the TPA process? Let's just, just talk about for the past year. So the pre well, the, sure, the so I, I can get you the exact amount, but okay. it's around $3 million um, within our Say last, one more time. It's around three, a little over $3 million um, total, and the resident portion- Annually? Excuse me? Annually? Annually, yeah. so, so this year, so within our, our allocation, it's um, 3.8 million, and the- 3.8 3. 3. million. 8 million. Um, which is subject to proration, so that's the, that's the total. Um, and the resident portion is uh, 2.3 million, or can we, we'll, we'll confirm the amount, but there's 40% which stays with the PHA and 60% which goes to- So which NYCHA's? So NYCHA's allocation is around 1.5 million. 1.5 million annually. Okay. And so I know that there was um, some discussions about that money is used to assist in the administrative part of um, the TPA process. So can you walk us through how NYCHA utilizes the 1.5 million annually? Sure, so we have a number of obligations um, to carry out with respect to administering TPA funds as well as meeting our other um, requirements under 964. So the funding is primarily used for um, staff time spent administering the funds as well as our resident advisory board process. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Staff time spent. So it goes to staff time, um, as well as our resident advisory board. So there are stipends, meals, transportation, other expenses with our resident advisory board that NYCHA uses a portion of the allocation for. Um, and, then, um, and then in terms of our staff time, there, a portion of the funding supports um, our local coordinators who um, you heard referenced many times during the testimony today who are the local staff who are on the ground who are providing one-on-one -on -one assistance. So let's go through that. Sure. So take a step back. Who are the NYCHA employees by title that actually are responsible for the TPA process? Sure, so I, I don't have the, the list of employees, but there are 15 community coordinators. We don't have to say the, the names, so not the names, but the. There are 15 community coordinators across the city. 15 a, community fif coordinators. Across the city, a, a portion of their time is charged to TPA. Um, we have a bookkeeper, we have um, two administrative staff, and then there's a supervisor who oversees the unit. Um, on our budget side, there are two employees who handle um, responsibilities within our budget department as well. And so it's, it's, it's the equivalent of 14 full-time um, employees based on the percent allocation across the number of staff involved. So you just said 14 full-time employees, right? But they don't spend their full, their, their full-time duties are not to do TPA, it's right? The, it, it equates to 14 full-time FTEs. 
based on the time allocation across the employees. At so, all right, so, it, so, so that's a serious statement, right? So can you explain to us how their time is utilized? Because now I'm thinking about if you, if you, just, if you work in a law firm, right, mm -hmm. and you're charging a client billable hours, mm -hmm. right, and you have staff on tasks that are supposed to be responsible for a particular case, those particular attorneys or whoever is staffed in that firm have to be able to state, I spent two hours on this particular case and this is how much I charge per hour, right? So if their billable hour is $150 an hour and they work two hours, that's $300 that they're gonna charge per whatever that case is. So can you provide us with some, some type of breakdown of the 14 um, staffers who are working on the TPA um, process? so that we could get a clear understanding of how that, because it's easy to say, oh, we have full-time staffers and they're doing this, they're doing that, but really be able to break down how their time is allocated on the TPA process. Are you able to provide us with that? Sure, so, so just, I'll answer that question in two parts. Um, so just a point of clarification, it's 14 FTEs. So there's more than 14 staff that are involved in TPA. It's a, the, based on the percentage of their time allocation, as well as staff who are 100% allocated to TPA, it's the equivalent of 14 full-time employees. But just to clarify what the roles are, the roles are very prescribed. So in the case of our 15 coordinators, they host the monthly meetings, so there are 30 meetings per month, which happen in the zones, and so those are specifically with resident associations and their board members. They receive and process proposals. So as I mentioned, we processed over 1,500 proposals last year. We have staff who process stipends and payments exclusively, so we processed over 1,400 of those stipends last year, as well as a percentage of time within our budget department for the staff who are, who are allocating the funds, maintaining them, and producing the monthly reports. And so in terms of time allocation and expenditure, um, last year our 40% equated to 1.5 million. In terms of staff time, we spent around the equivalent of two point, around two million in terms of staff time. So NYCHA- I, I, So it, I still don't understand how you came up with that. It, it seems like you're like multiplying just like the staff itself, but not the actual work that's being done. You get what I'm saying? So, I, so that's what I'm, I'm just trying to really get a, a, a clear understanding of just on a, I don't know, like a, a hourly basis or a weekly basis, something, something different. So, so I'm not able to provide you like an hourly break, breakout, an aggregate of, of the staff time across. Because the when I look at the num like so 1.5 million, right, and you divide that by 14 people, that could be a salary of like $107,000 per, per, like per worker, but we know that they're not making that amount of money. So that's why I'm just trying to really get an understanding so of how the money is spent. Yeah, I mean, so that's salary and fringe. So NYCHA's expenditures include our fringe rate as well as any other costs pertaining to staff. So we're happy to provide you with like the percent breakout by title. I don't have that with me today. I have in total the amount that, were ex that was expended in personnel costs um, in connection to TPA. I'm happy to provide that breakout to you. That will, th yes, yeah, so that will be, that not just that it's helpful, but it's necessary. Because sure. I still don't have a clear understanding um, of how the time is allocated to justify the amount of funding that NYCHA receives for the administration, especially when we just hear so many um, like concerns of when they call NYCHA in order to get assistance or have some kind of um, follow-up or feedback, there's no response. You know, we've, I've, I've, we've heard from several residents where they will make a call and um, no one returns the call. And I know that as a council member, I receive, um, uh, I'm BCC'd on a lot of emails and copied on a lot of emails that are back and forth between resident engagement asking for assistance with different vendors or proposals or bills. And, um, and it's, uh, the, the emails I usually see is, you know, you have not responded yet and now I'm copying my council member. Mm -hmm. And so if you are doing this particular work, we should be able to see exactly um, how much time is allocated per employee for the TPA process so that we can have a clear understanding. I'm happy to provide that breakout, but I just also want to reiterate 
Um, a lot of this work is happening in our coordinators and their role that is which is locally based. And so on a weekly basis, they're reaching out to their TAs. They are regularly meeting with them. They're assisting them with the process. So there were tenants that you heard today who discussed, you know, my coordinator came out to my development and helped upload receipts. We are hosting 30 meetings per month going through these topics. And so there is lots of hand uh, direct assistance that's being offered by our staff as well as a back-end administrative function. So we're happy to provide you with that breakout. Okay, thank you. And so moving on, um, there were references made to, um, you know, HUD being the, like the, 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 the organization that guides this whole process. But then we also heard that NYCHA has its own policies and, and regulations and restrictions. So can you explain to us the difference between what HUD actually mandates related to the money and what extra restrictions NYCHA put in place? Mm -hmm. Sure, so each housing authority has to adopt, should adopt a policy based on HUD regulations. And so we are expected to adopt a policy our policy is consistent with the regulations. So with respect to, to additional restrictions, um, there, there are no restrictions in terms of eligibility or expenditures that um, conflict or are different than what has been outlined in the regulation. The process is outlined by the PHA, which HUD does not specify a process, and that is the, what's reflected in our policy. Okay, so can you give us an example of um, if the policy is written, but NYCHA just has to interpret the policy, mm -hmm. can you explain to us how you may interpret one of the policies? Sure, so when we, we use proposals in order to evaluate the resident association's request based on the HUD criteria. So HUD has a, a list of do's and don'ts or ineligible and eligible activities, and that's actually verbatim in our um, guidebook. We also use the PHI notice to inform our guidebook. So if there is a resident association making a request, we will review their proposal relative to what the what is in the guidebook to make a determination. So our policy is consistent with what has been outlined by HUD as eligible and ineligible, and our review process is using a proposal to review. Okay, we're gonna come back to that because we just have some questions about the actual eligibility, eligibility restrictions that NYCHA does not impose. Um, however, there seems to be just um, some serious problems and restrictions that are coming from NYCHA. And so we're just gonna like, I'm mean, just kind of figure that out. So just to give, if it's helpful, just to give some context, as I mentioned in my testimony, we received over 1,500 proposals last year. Only 28 proposals were rejected. And so the vast majority of proposals that we receive are approved. Of the pr proposals we received, 59 were um, initially rejected, 31 were resubmitted based on the guidance that was offered by NYCHA, 28 were ultimately rejected due to ineligibility. So 4% of the proposals that we receive have a conditional rejection, and then 2% are actually rejected. The majority of proposals that we receive are eligible, are within the guidelines, the training, the technical assistance is proving to be effective, and on NYCHA's end, we are working with TAs to make sure that the proposals that they submit are ultimately accepted. Okay, I'm gonna go back and forth between my questions, but I know that we've been here for two hours, and so I'm going to allow my um, colleagues to interject with their questions while I go back and forth. So the first question will come from Council Member Ruben Diaz Sr. Followed by Council Member Ayala. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, good morning, Ms. Uh, Sherman and ladies and gentlemen. What is the purpose of the TPA? So TPA funds should be used for activities that support um, a positive quality of life um, within the development. They can include self-sufficiency activities, community building activities, organizing, outreach. And the TPA president supposed to be 
the eyes, ears, and voice of, of, of NYCHA? Yeah, so the, the funds are um, allocated through our resident councils who are the local uh, organized body on the ground who would best know how to use them for the development. So the best person to know what's going on in, in the development would be the TA president. Agreed. They, they, they will know more than NYCHA. So the people who live in a community are, are the experts? So our expectation so is if what you, I'm saying, if something happens in development, a problem happens, the TA person, I assume, you know, I, I assume that the, the TA person will know more than NYCHA what's going on. So we regularly seek information from our resident associations so when, there on the ground. So when something happens, NYCHA consult the TA president. Or NYCHA doesn't give the TA president that credit. I'm sorry, can you, NYCHA? If something happened in a development, mm -hmm. a tragedy, a problem, something, NYCHA will consult the TA president before taking action. I'm, so, I don't, I, I'm saying, I'm I'm saying what don't. kind of response? What kind of responsibility NACHA believe the TA president has? Or did NACHA give credit to them or no? Just they, they are like. So I'm, I'm unclear about, about your question, but the, the expenditure of TPA funds is driven by the tenant association. Uh, my question they decide is, what's best for you, their community. I could, I could ask my question again. TA president are there to help NYCHA and to be consulted when something happens so NYCHA we have a clear picture more, more or less of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes, that's the role of a resident association. So if something happens, NYCHA will consult the TA president. So I, I would need a, an, I'm, not, I'm unclear of what you're asking me. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm asking. Okay. For, example, for example, let me, We have a problem in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. This week there was a problem. A person by the name Bienvenido Martinez is an elderly man who was kicked out of his Bronx apartment by heartless NYCHA person. A 72-year-old man was not only addicted from his home of 14 years, but all of his personal important possession were thrown into the garbage. Yeah, do you know about the case? I do. Okay. Before NYCHA took the action of throwing Mr. Bienvenido Martinez out, did NYCHA consult with the TA president of the development and ask, did you know about this person? Do you know what happened? So I can't speak to the, the steps involved. Um, in that case, and you know, we certainly um, find it to be regrettable, and are working to make sure that that he's um, that we're taking care of him. Well, I can't my, speak to my, those specific my question, steps. How many is, more, Mr. Bienvenido Martinez, we have throughout the city of New York? Because Nacha doesn't take the time to consult the TA president. Uh, what's going on? You know something about it before taking us? What I'm, my, my concern is, if we have a TA president. We have the TA association. What, what, what do we have them there? Do, if, why do we have them there if they are not consulted, if NYCHA just don't, don't care about them? Let me take another thing. TA president, they have a room, right? They have a, they, they assign a room. So in our communities, we would like to have a room with TA president or the TA meeting or the TA association. We like to have a nice room, um, clean, mm -hmm. something. So if they spend money, like happened to Ms. Monique Johnson, if they, from Thronic Development, if they spend money to fix their office, to fix their, their room, to have a refrigerator, to put their water, whatever, why is she investigated? Why is she being investigated for that? Why is she being accused of? of something because because she's doing something 
for the development and for the association to have a nice room, a nice place. Sure. So, I mean, I can't speak to the specifics of that, and that would be DOI, um, who is the investigating party, not NYCHA. Um, I can speak broadly to tenant association spaces, and so um, we are required to the extent available to provide spaces for resident associations to convene. They should be in good condition, so if there are day-to-day -day repair issues, they would work with their property manager to, to address. That usually happens at the local level. I just want, I just, um, and, I, and I just want to works. say, last, last thing, I would have to say this. NYCHA president and NYCHA association, they volunteers. They don't get paid. They give that time to help NYCHA and to help the resident to have a good relationship and to get the, the, to get the thing that they need. Why NYCHA doesn't, doesn't take, doesn't see that? Why NYCHA doesn't say, oh, they, they there to help me. They there to help us. Why are we eating and then here and then and, and don't give them what they need so they could help NYCHA? Because I think that's in NYCHA take into consideration their time, their, vol their volunteer and, and give them the resources and, and don't put so many problems for them to get the resources. I think that the, our people will, look, will, will do better and, and, and the TA president and the TA, the, the TPI association will, will do better. Don't you agree? Well, my, my, ask, my question to you is, why don't you, Nacha, give more respect and more consideration and more credit to people that I volunteer I mean, giving their time, trying to help our, our residents. Why don't you give more credit to them? I mean, they, they deserve that at least. And that's my question. So, or did, did you want me to respond to that? Or So I would say, Council Member, I share your respect with uh, resident associations and agree that they're volunteers. They work hard in their community. Um, some of the most, you know, passionate dedicated New Yorkers I've met have been NYCHA resident associations. And so the process that we put in place was designed to make sure that accessing funds was easier and, and we are seeing the results. So the majority of requests that come in are approved and the majority of resident associations are using the commercial card to draw down and make purchases more quickly. Twelve, twelve TA president testified this morning. Mm -hmm. I was here, I, 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 I've been listening. They all complaining most more more about the same. So if you don't think that 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 their testimony doesn't worth anything, I mean, they say help us, please let us work, let us help us. You are killing us. That's what they're saying. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. Um, one minute, um, Council Member. How many resident associations are recognized right now? So we have 245 uh, recognized associations. <laughs> okay, and recognized uh, associations. And wait, you mentioned that NYCHA received about 1,500 proposals, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's 245 recognized resident associations, that's an average of about six proposals for the year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's a range from associations. Yeah. That's not a lot of proposals, and it's not a lot of work related to the proposals when we're talking about $1.5 million in administrative work, right? And then when you said 30 of them were rejected, it was, you know, and it was, 1,500, and you, you compare that to just 30, but when you look at the number of actual resident associations, the numbers just don't really add up. And so it, it would be helpful, again, to be able to get a list of the, how the funds are actually used, because six proposals, five, six proposals is just not a lot of proposals when we're talking about 245 developments. I mean, I'm association, so. We'll come back to that. Councilmember Ayala, sorry about that. <laughs> it was in my head. She asked my question. 
Um, but I, so this is one of the things that I, I mean, one of the issues that I hear consistently about from my resident leaders, they are absolutely not satisfied with this process. They've never been happy with the process. Uh, they felt like they were excluded from conversations. They felt like they were being told what they had to do. They were never asked if they wanted to participate. It doesn't appear based on, on what I'm hearing today that HUD actually mandates this specific program, right? This is a policy that NYCHA instituted. Is there, I mean, based on everything that you've heard today, is NYCHA willing to go back and re-engage? Because it's pretty evident that enough people are dissatisfied and enough people feel like they're not being heard that a conversation needs to be had. And I think that the fact that we continue to bypass that is a, is, is, is a reflection of exactly what the residents are saying here today, that they're not being heard. Because if enough people are telling me, council member, I don't like the way that you're doing something, then I have to stop and readjust and I have to rethink how I'm doing things because I wanna make sure that I'm representing my constituency correctly. So what is NYCHA ready, you know, like have there been any internal conversations about maybe revamping this system? Is there an opt out, you know, uh, option for those resident leaders who don't wanna participate? As you heard today, many of them are elderly. They had difficulties even navigating the new electronic system. So what, what does that look like internally for NYCHA? Sure, so we're always happy to continue to engage and go back to the table, that, that's for sure. Um, just to take a step back, the, the way this process was reformed actually started with resident focus groups. So there were 11 focus groups of resident leaders across the city. They provided input on not only what it's, they wanted to see change with respect to tenant participation, but the other ways in which NYCHA engaged resident associations. What we heard was people wanted to have more visibility on their funding. The process that NYCHA had where we procured every single good and service on their behalf was not working. And they wanted to make sure that they had a, a way to access funding, but that it was um, not, the, people were concerned about having cash, right? And NYCHA as well, but certainly tenant associations having access to large sums of cash. And so the process that we put in place was the commercial card because it was the most responsive to what we heard from resident associations where NYCHA was for many years procuring goods and services with the same supply chain systems that we use to procure refrigerators and stoves, right? So very inefficient systems for what are usually very small purchases. We also know that having a cash-based system for allocating millions of dollars is not effective or safe for resident associations, um, as well as NYCHA. And so the commercial card was introduced to really solve for that problem. We have implemented it over, um, an eight, over a year and a half, actually. So there was not an immediate switch to the commercial card. It's been over a year and a half that we've rolled in the process, and it's not complete. Um, so about 78% of tenant associations are using the card. We still have a remainder of associations that we're looking to bring onto the card. Wait, by how, many, how many resident associations are in the, in the system? 78%. And now do you keep track of how many of those felt like they were being forced to, to sign the agreement? Because it, it, you know, based on your testimony, it sounds like you know, people were hunky-dory you know, signing on to this agreement. But the reality is that a lot of people felt like they were told, if you don't sign the agreement, you're not going to get any money. There will not be a family date. There will not be activities. Nothing is going to happen in your development. That was the message that was being conveyed. Maybe that's not what you intended, but that's what I, even, I was hearing. And I, I get that it's taken a year and a half, but I think that it's taken a year and a half because there's been a lot of pushback. So out of the 78% that are in the system, how many of those resident leaders willingly said, you know what, this is a process that really works for me, I'm really excited about it, I'm going to go in, and how many of them were told, you know what, if you don't sign up, you're not going to get your money, which is why we still have resident associations that haven't seen a penny uh, after this rollout two years later. So during this period, the, the commercial card has still been a choice. And so as people come into the system, they're doing so by their choice. And as we've worked with resident associations, when they found their you know, neighbor who's using the card, usually that is the person that has brought them along and, and, ex and they've expressed an interest in the card. We've also have had um, instances where um, an entire cluster within a, a specific zone of ours will start to use the card and they'll get trained together and support each other through the process. And so it has still been a choice and the agreement reflects that it is a choice until we move into a 100% process. I'm being told that resident leaders have until June, I believe, to sign on if they want to see money. And they're, they're not even, now they don't even have the option because bef last year it was like, if you don't sign, you simply don't get your money. And now it's like this year, 2019, by, t by June, whatever date you know, is set, you will be signing on to this agreement whether you like it or not. So, th so just there's two separate um, 
questions rolled in there. So one is, you, you're required to have a funding agreement to access funding. Whether you use a commercial card or not, that's a HUD requirement. The tool to access your funding has been a choice, using the commercial card until, and yes, our goal is this summer to have 100% utilization of the card so that we're not managing two systems where NYCHA is still procuring meeting refreshments through what is a very inefficient process. And so during that, the rollout of the commercial card, we did um, in the initial pilot phase a survey of around 80 tenant associations who were like the first few, uh, group in the card. And some of what we heard is, is certainly consistent with what we heard today and it's, uh, it reflects um, the changes that we're looking to make when we move fully into the new process. So um, the receipts are required to be uploaded in 72 hours. We're looking, um, and that requires some adjustment with departments other than ours as well as the bank to make that into a seven day process. Um, we're also looking to eliminate the requirement for proposals for um, a number of activities that we consider routine. And this is where we're looking to get more guidance from HUD as, as to whether that will still satisfy the requirements, but that will make the process much easier. So if you just set your refreshment budget for the year, you have that amount available on the card. There's no need to come back to us until next year when you set your budget. So there's ways in which we are looking to make the process more efficient, but between the choices of NYCHA procuring everything or NYCHA outlying cash, the having a card-based system is what we consider to be the most efficient and also is... Is it the most efficient for the residents or is it the most efficient for NYCHA? The majority of residents, again, when we surveyed them during the process, they're the, 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 of the things that they liked about the cart, they expressed that it was convenient. Around 60% said that it was much more convenient and also that they could buy local. Like they're not limited to vendors that do business with NYCHA, which is something that we heard. So I, I, I appreciate the intent, I really do. I think that a lot of our systems are really antiquated and we need to you know, modernize, I get that. I just, I really strongly feel that you know, resident leaders, many of whom I represent that are here today, um, have been excluded from a true conversation about the pathway for uh, really doing that in a way that is reflective of the needs of all of the resident leaders. And my, what may work for you may not work for me. What may work for one development doesn't necessarily work for the other. I have a lot of concerns about this, this transition. I have been, you know, uh, attempting, I think we, you know, even through, through my former, uh, my predecessor, you know, there were many conversations I had back and forth um, about this agreement. And so I don't want to monopolize too much of the time because my colleagues have been waiting. Um, but I really do hope that you know, the outcome of today's hearing is that NYCHA uh, really truly uh, listen to the concerns that were raised here today and come back, you know, with, a, with, with some sort of action plan that is a little bit better reflective of those concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Gibson. Thank you, Chair, thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Sherman, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming, and I want to certainly acknowledge and recognize all of our resident leaders that came from all across the city um, for coming here today. I know it's not easy to come to City Hall, but we really appreciate a lot of the input. And um, just for your understanding, I represent a number of developments in the Bronx, um, particularly uh, Forrest, McKinley, Webster, Butler, Morris, Highbridge, Sedgwick, Claremont Parkway, and Claremont Consolidated. Um, and I remember when this program was rolled out uh, just a few years ago, and you know, honestly, I am amazed that so much has been done with so little input from tenants. Um, this has been, to me, a virtual nightmare. And I really, really am sympathetic to NYCHA, and I understand this is a, a task that you have had to implement um, under you know, HUD regulations and HUD guidelines, um, but this just was flawed from the beginning. And so I just have a couple of questions just to better understand, because most of the feedback, and I'm speaking just on behalf of myself, my colleagues can speak on their behalf, but most of the city council's involvement in this process of the TPA program has really been because we've demanded it. NYCHA did not come to the city council early on and even engage the council members. I came to NYCHA when I got a slew of complaints and concerns from all of my resident leaders across my district. And so just even in that regard, we have a communication problem between the city council and housing, and that has to change. So under HUD regulation, 
up to 40% of the TPA program, NYCHA is allowed to take for administrative purposes, correct? Mm -hmm. So that means that NYCHA can make a decision to not take up to 40% of administrative costs. Is that correct? Yes. So at any given time, if NYCHA decides to take less than 40%, would that money in turn go back to the TPA program for the resident associations? So NYCHA, just two points. So NYCHA doesn't have a choice in terms of carrying out its obligations. Mm -hmm. This is one of the few mandates that we have that's actually funded. And so we use the funding to support the work that we do at NYCHA relative to not only TPA, but elections and a number of the other responsibilities that we have. We exceed the uh, amount allocated to us in the work that we do because it involves departments far beyond resident engagement. That being said, if we were to, um, if we were discussing this at a time when resident associations um, were inadequately funded and not rolling over funds, I think that would be a very different thing, but resident associations by and large are expending their, their current allocation but still have uh, rollover allocations available to them. I think secondly, we are looking to use some of um, our, our TPA funding to support bringing on providers that can offer assistance to some of the smaller resident associations where we see that they are um, not as consistently spending money. So I think the work that we, the way that we would use our fund will continue to be in service of um, tenant participation funds and resident associations. And whether it's directly using it to support the, the work at NYCHA or using some of our administrative allocation with third party groups, it would be in service of the program. Okay, and the reason I ask that because it would seem to me that housing should be doing everything possible to ensure that we maximize funds for resident associations. Um, and essentially, the administrative cost that we're talking about, the 1.5 million that is the 40% of the overall number, the staff that you talked about and alluded to, the resident advisory board, the local coordinators, and the 14 FTE staff you talked about, are NYCHA employees today. And so there's a portion of their salary that is being subsidized by the TPA funds, correct? This is our operating subsidy, yes, okay, and it's right. allocated for the But purpose. no, I'm, I'm, I'm accurate yeah. in that statement. Absolutely. Okay, okay. So I guess the reason why I'm asking that is because I understand that in the change and the shifting of this program, we're trying to streamline the process better. Um, but where I'm getting most of the concern and, and the feedback and a lot of the inquiry is that if the res associations do not sign up for this particular agreement, and just to speak on the agreement, you referenced legal aid and, and the city council and others that were involved. We did that because we were getting so many complaints about the language in the agreement. And so I, I recognize that, you know, NYCHA is taking credit for including the city council and legal aid, but let's understand that's only because we demanded to be a part of this process because we were excluded in the beginning. And so I understand and I, I'm thankful for legal aid and I'm thankful for the city council, but this process could have happened better at the start if NYCHA recognized that you have partners in the resident associations as well as the city council. And so we're here talking about this for a reason because there was truly a fundamental level of flaw that happened in this process to begin with. So the staff that we're talking about whose salary is subsidized by the TPA program, what I'm trying to understand is with, all, with the proposals that you received the 1500, what is the time frame? Because a lot of the issues that we're getting is timeliness and expediting payments and agreement approvals. So what is the average time frame that your office handles all of the proposals that you're receiving? Sure, so um, just, just to take a step back in terms of our staff and, and our involvement in TPA, right? So our goal is to see, is the same as yours. It is to see this money benefit residents and improve quality of life at developments. And that's the work that we're doing. And it, again, it doesn't only involve our resident engagement team, but many other NYCHA departments. In terms of the proposal submission process, um, the proposals go into a central box. It's reviewed by staff for like a first round of eligibility. That response is usually within 72 hours. It then moves into our internal system 
um, and, is and, and the, the proposal is approved from thereafter. If it is um, something simple like meeting refreshments or um, a stipend, for instance, it would, that, that approval process would move through very quickly. If it is something that is more involved, like a consultant, um, or there's supporting documentation needed, there could be a lot of back and forth with the tenant association if we don't have the materials needed. Once the pro the, it is pr approved, if you have the commercial card, the expenditure is automatic. You're, the funding is made available, you can expend. I think where we have delays is when NYCHA is in charge of, pro of procuring thereafter, and that could, you, typically that's 30 days post-approval. So the process can be lengthy, which is one of the many reasons why we introduced the card, so that if you submit your proposal, you're approved, and the goal is that if you are a resident association and use the commercial card process, you submit all of your proposals for the quarter. Once that's approved, that amount of money is available on your card. There's no need to return to a proposal approval with NYCHA until the next quarter. Have you looked so far at all the proposals you received to look at trends? So if there are consistent proposals that are being sent to you from the RAs, does that lessen the time frame or does it lessen the possibility of duplication? Does the resident association still have to submit another proposal even though it was something that was already submitted in the previous quarter because they're having consistent meetings, if it's trainings, if it's OSHA or any other certification programs? Do you look at patterns that the RAs have been submitting in terms of proposals? We do. So, so that's part of one of the things that I, I mentioned where there are certain types of proposals that we want to eliminate. So HUD requires that we have justifications for the expenditures. Um, and we have had discussions and reviews with HUD where they you know, were, were interested in like specific information about how funds were expended by resident association. And so we want to make sure that we have that level of justification, but that it's easier for residents. So based on the trends that we see, um, we're looking to remove the proposal requirement for most small purchases. And so this is refreshments, telephone, things that um, are pretty consistent where we feel that the budget is sufficient to justify the expenditure. Um, where we've seen challenges are proposals for consulting services, out of town travel in particular. And so last year we issued tip sheets to resident associations, which really pulled out from the guidebook the pain points that, that we consistently see with those proposals and offered specific guidance around how to make those proposals um, align with the regulations and also where um, the activity is explic explicitly ineligible that we're offering a clear justification as to why. So those are two, based on what we've seen, those are two areas where we've either offered more guidance and more technical assistance or where we're looking to make a change and that change would be to actually eliminate the proposals altogether. Okay, and for the resident associations that have not yet signed an agreement, and I understood what you're saying in terms of HUD requires that an agreement is in place, but I also believe that if you are you know, holding TPA funds hostage and you're telling tenants associations that in order for you to receive you know, your TPA funds, you have to sign on to this commercial card, I mean, that's coercion. That's a sign of force, and it's, you know, a lot of the tenants associations that have already signed on, it's not like many of them felt like they did it willingly. They felt like they had no other opportunity, they had no other choice. And so my question is, how are we preparing to get other TAs either online, or what are we doing to make sure that we can fix a lot of the discrepancies that have been talked about today that your office is very well aware of um, to make this program actually successful? Um, I, I don't imagine that we're going to start from scratch, but if we can tweak the system and make it better, is that something that NYCHA is prepared to do? So again, we're always this is a continued improvement upon the process. We're always willing to, con to have those conversations with residents and address those concerns, um, as well as we are happy to come back to you around you know, specific items in your district to, to talk through those as well too. I will just add that um, you know, prior to this reform process, TPA funds were kept at a district level. There was, there was very little visibility for resident associations and the general public around those funds. That has changed. We also had a process that required NYCHA to procure every single good and service. That has changed as well. We have residents who are engaged in the process who are using these, their allocation to make positive change within their development. And last year, residents 
largely maximized their annual allocation. So their portion of the funds were almost fully expended, and that's a big change from the way the funding has been uh, allocated in the past. So this is a continued improvement upon the process. And for the remaining resident associations that are not on the card, that is the work that we're doing now, is the one-on-one -on -one assistance to be able to introduce the program um, and help them come on board. My last question before I turn it back to our chair. Uh, with every resident association signing the TPA agreement, they assume all responsibility and all liability for the usage of the commercial card. So if there are missing documentations or missing vouchers or any sorts of receipts, what's, what role does NYCHA play? Are we putting the entire responsibility of this card on the resident associations because they have signed this agreement? So NYCHA's fiscal conduit of the funds, we are ultimately responsible for the funds. It is, that is the reason that we also have to have accountability measures in place if we're disaggregating them among, amongst hun hundreds of resident associations. So as a resident association, you are responsible for making sure that you're spending your funds um, in the guidelines of the proposal that has been approved, which you've presented to NYCHA. You're also responsible for making sure that there are receipts for your expenditures. The tools that we have available um, really are focused on supporting people through the process. So if you have not uploaded your receipts, we are calling you to identify where the receipts are. Um, if there are concerns about using the system, you heard examples today of where our staff have gone out to the development and sat in the office with you to help you upload the documents that you need. If you are submitting a proposal and it doesn't meet the HUD criteria, the reason why we're sending it back to you is so that you are adding the information necessary so that you are presenting an eligible proposal. So our role is to work in partnership with the association to make sure that they're used in accordance with the guidelines. But yes, both parties are certainly accountable, which is why we've put systems in place to support resident associations around their expenditures. Okay. Um, my final comment, I know we need to keep the hearing moving. Um, I really appreciate the work that really, honestly, has been undertaken. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, generally speaking, I am not satisfied at where we have you know, been in terms of where we are today. I do not think that NYCHA should take a full 40% for administrative. I think you should look at lowering that amount and giving more back to the tenants. And the reason I say that is because my colleagues and I, every single year when we pass a budget here at this city council, we give our tenants associations money directly to the tenants associations. And so the less you give them, the more they come and ask us. And again, I'm happy to support my tenants associations, but what I am not going to do is allow NYCHA to continue to take money that could essentially go to the resident associations. And so I would ask you, again, I don't know if this is possible, but it's something to consider. NYCHA does not need to take a full 40%. We're talking about NYCHA staff that is already salaried coming from NYCHA, and that money could simply be used to help our tenants associations. Um, coupled with all of the things that I generally know my tenants associations are doing, and I'm asked all the time, all the time to support a number of events. And where I can, I do, but I'm not a bank. I don't have it all. Um, I help support, but I can't foot the bill. And I think NYCHA should really do more to make sure that you can maximize the funds that you do get and also look at how you can um, give the tenants associations a little bit more to make sure that they're doing more to provide basic services for the tenants that they represent. So that's just my two cents in this conversation. And I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. I have two quick questions before we go to Council Member Menchaca. How many developments do not currently have a resident association and what is the current plan to get them running? Sure, so we have um, 37 developments um, without active representation, so that means that they, there's no attendant association at all or there's a tenant association that is not recognized at this time, right? They may. Um, have missing officers, or, be, or we actually have an election process underway right now with 37 developments. Um, so some of them are in that election process as we speak. So there, there's a mix. Um, when we started this process, there were around 20 plus developments that did not have representation. We're down to now only 12. These are a lot of our 
um, small scattered sites. So part of the plan there, um, and I mentioned this earlier, is we are looking to see where after we really uh, finish what has been an administrative uh, transformation is to really focus more on the programmatic. Um, and that includes bringing in partners who can assist those small developments, either in forming a tenant association or leading um, with a participatory process for residents who live in those buildings so that they can make use of the funds. Um, some of these developments are rehabs that could be connected to their quote unquote parent um, association. So those are some of the strategies that we're looking at there. And the other associations um, are developments where there's association exists, but they may uh, be not recognized at this time either because they're going through an election or they have a vacancy have, or a number, number of items. Have any of these developments been um, without an association for a considerable amount of time? So the, the 12, um, for sure. So these are developments where, um, at least as far as our records show, they did not have a history of having um, a resident association. And there were another 12 where there is one now. And so some of these are those non-established, long-term non-established are in our current um, election cycle as we speak. Um, and these are, again, a lot of the small rehabs. Okay, and um, another quick follow-up is about the out-of-town travel. Mm -hmm. You said that you saw some trends and there's been some, um, just some experiences and you're working on that policy. Can you just give us an example of what are some of the problems that you see with out-of-town travel? Sure, so um, I, when we're reviewing a proposal for out-of-town travel, we want to, one, make sure, and HUD requires this, that there's a compelling justification for um, the resident association to travel outside of its jurisdiction. So if it's a service or a consultant that can offer um, the program locally, um, that should be the first course of action. If it's um, something that needs to be out of town because there's, there's, there's a compelling justification, the resident association would need to provide that. We would also seek uh, to ensure that the resident association has provided broad access so that the out-of-town travel has been advertised to residents within the community, um, that the participants are different over the years and that there's more participation from the membership. And so um, we've given that guidance to resident associations as those proposals come in. Um, and they've either gone back and modified or, um, or, or have also moved to hosting the workshop that they're interested in, for instance, locally, which also would allow for more, more uh, residents to participate. Just for purposes of, of you know, something that we see on an annual basis, can you give us an example of, um, let's say, the residents go to um, Albany for the caucus on an annual basis. They go up to Albany the month of February. Are there any issues um, that are related to that particular out-of-town travel to Albany for the legislative conferences? And can you explain to us what those issues are or if there are no issues? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, this is an example to yeah, give us something a, that we actually yep. see on a consistent basis. So that's not something that could be offered locally. Um, so co conferences like low income housing conference, people, you know, uh, go there a lot as well. Um, I think the, the important item would be to make sure the proposal submitted within enough time for NYCHA to review. Um, in the past, uh, NYCHA uh, essentially performed all of the travel arrangements for resident associations. Um, and so now with the commercial card, they can very quickly make those arrangements th themselves. Um, there may be certain items within the conference agenda that aren't permissible based on the HUD guidelines, but that is a perfectly um, permissible expense. Again, we would want to see that the resident association has um, had a process to select who's attending and has opened that up to, to the community. Um, and that, you know, they are bringing what they've learned back to their local association. Okay, thank you. Council Member Vinchaka. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sherman and Mr. Priston for being here today. Uh, I, I think my colleagues have done a good job of, of, of kind of uh, unveiling some of the bigger, bigger questions. And so what I want to do is, is ask some specific questions on the accountability side. And there was a number that was thrown out of $5 million that was lost between the t uh, 2000 and 2005. And can you comment on that and, and where those funds are, what happened, uh, and what your office has kind of received in terms of that allegation or um, uh, loss of information for TPA funds? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not able to speak to that specific um, allegation. I can give you an overview of how the funds were um, reallocated and, and just what that process was. Um, NYCHA performed a 10-year look back in 2016 on TPA funds. 
Um, that was based on everything that was in the authority's bank balance at that time. Um, NYCHA maintains custodial, a custodial bank account on behalf of resident associations. That was a 10-year look back, so that was 2006. It does not mean that there wasn't funding provided before then. It's just that review period was over those 10 years. So how much, how much did that look back reveal in terms of funding that was not allocated and was needing to get reappropriated? Sure. So um, what it really reflected was the, the process, right? So NYCHA's process prior to 2016 um, was that we allocated funding by district. So the nine districts across the city um, adopted... How many? The nine, uh, the nine council the nine. districts at that time um, adopted a budget annually. Um, and then what remained from that budget was then uh, disaggregated by dwelling unit uh, amongst the resident associations that were in their district. Um, the spending was proportional to dwelling unit that, that was identified, and the recommendations from our audit department was to reallocate the funding by dwelling unit, um, but to really use the, the, the formula that HUD has, which is that it starts at the bottom and then, then moves to the top, right? So the funding is now allocated across all of our developments, uh, developments then opt in to, to fund their districts, um, and the funding is closer to where, as HUD would term, the beneficiaries are. Um, so that, that was really what that reform process was about, and um, moving forward, it has been allocated at the development level since. And I must have, I don't know, I was writing, did I miss the number that, that was out? Real? So it was around 13 million at that time. 13 million at that time. And that's what you're talking about in terms of redistributing across the districts. You mentioned nine districts. Exactly. And so to that point, right, that was 13 million that had accumulated well over a decade. And so um, where we are now is that we are seeing resident associations, uh, the resident portion of TPA funds for last year was around 2.3 million. Um, resident associations spent a little over 2 million. So they're, they're almost fully maximizing their annual allocation, which is really a step in the right direction. Um, and so the goal is to really work strategically around how we reallocate those back funds, right? And how we work with resident associations to more strategically plan those funds. And so, you know, I think this also speaks to the council member question around NYCHA's portion of the allegation. Resident associations all have funding, um, and most have funding that has still carried over from, from years prior. Um, any additional um, streamlining that we have on NYCHA's end with respect to our administrative fund, we're looking to use to bring on partners who can offer more technical assistance in expending those prior allocations. Got it. Um, I, I'm still a little confused, and so help me here. So 13 million through the 10 year look back, uh, you've come up with a plan to redistribute them into the districts based on tenancy of apartment dwellings per, uh, you're, you're trying to do equity here. And then now we're at a spending of about 2 million to the 2.3 allocated per year. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, so there's still, like, there's still a gap of, of funding that is not yet kind of redistributed. And so you're trying to figure it's, out what to do with no, that. So it's, it's redistributed, it's not be full. It's so every resident association has access to the annual allocation and all of their rollover funds. It has been redistributed. It. Every now, year they get a letter with the amount that's rolled over from the prior year, if, if any has. Okay, now I'm getting now I'm getting more clear. And I think what what's important, and this is something that I, I expect and, and I get often from Red Hook, and that's the only Red Hook East and West that, that I represent, the largest in Brooklyn, the second largest conglomeration of, of apartments in the city. Uh, there's a there's a real true connection to wanting uh, a participatory democracy, a, transparency, a transparent democracy, participatory budgeting has really given a lot of the young people uh, a new way of thinking about funding and the transparency around funding. And so are all those details uh, open to the public? So yeah, so part of this reform was to create a more transparent process. So for the first time, at least in my history at NYCHA, or at least from our knowledge, that information is publicly available, it's online. 
Uh, we provide the budget for every single development. If you are a resident at Red Hook, you can go online and find out how much was allocated to your development. The, um, annual, the annual and the rollback? The rollback, you know, the full amount available. Okay. Um, we are looking to um, provide spending profiles so that you also have a sense of how that, in large category, um, how that was spent um, as well. And then, um, again, looking to work with partners who could support a participatory process um, with resident associations or support resident-led activities that could um, focus on some of those prior allocations, but that is available. Great, and, and I think the, the last piece is, uh, and, and I, you've been testifying for a long time, so I, I wanna continue this conversation and really kind of think about Red Hook as, as a space. This is such a massive project, and the only way we can get through is, I, I think, <coughs> at a development-by-development development basis, and so we wanna work with your office to do this. Um, but there was a lot of conversation about, about and, and what I called professionalism or professionalizing, and it might have gotten lost in translation, but the idea that, that people should be paid for their work. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of what we're doing here is, is, is kind of demanding and um, requiring certain levels of ability that are, are kind of could be connected to a sense of, of a pay for, for work. This is, this is work. This is a lot of work. And it's not easy. And so for a volunteer who makes it, has to make a decision about going to work, whatever job they have, and then coming back and doing this as a side gig that's unpaid is, is unfair. And so how, how is NYCHA thinking about this in terms of the 40% administrative to be instead um, rethought of as, as, as paying the administration for this from the council, is that something that you're thinking about in terms of the, the continued reform? And, and then the transparency piece has to kind of be, because once you start paying folks and then everyone has to be held accountable and then, then we can really put all the accountability in terms of the guidelines, the TPA guidelines. And, and I'm thinking that's, 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 a, that's the way in to this. That's, that's the way in. That, that, that brings respect and, and payment for work that's being done for the people's budget. This is a people's budget. This is, and, and not a volunteer. This is serious because we're seeing a lot of problems here. So I, if you don't want to comment on that. Sure, so I agree that, um, you know, we want to make this process easier. The, the, the obligations are significant as well, just based on the guidelines. These are, and I want to emphasize, these are our operating dollars, just like any other operating dollar that comes to NYCHA. They're held to the same procurement requirements, the same fiduciary requirements, and our expectation is not that a resident association is taking that on. And so it is for that reason that NYCHA, as many PHAs, have to have infrastructure to make sure the funding is administered according to the regulatory framework. That being said, there is a level of, of accountability that's required with resident associations, and our goal is to make that process as easy as possible. If you're a resident association, you have a one-on-one -on -one local coordinator who is your point person, and it was, it was pleasing to hear that even those tenant associations who have had challenges have expressed how important their coordinator has been to them, that on an annual basis is going through your letter with you, can assist you with your budget, is going through what's required. The budget is a one-page form. It just outlines categories. Once that is submitted, you would then submit a proposal, which is also one-page form for the activities that you want to do. We're looking can to I, eliminate the proposal. So can I just pause? Because sure. I, I think I think what you're saying is is no, that you have a process that's really kind of geared to support a volunteer team. What I'm saying is reshifting the thinking here and really, really bringing in the councils as partners, paid, paid partners, uh, with all the other TPA guidelines, like, or kind of resident council uh, guidelines with term limits, and like, these are, these are jobs, these could be, these could be jobs. And I think that's, that's what I'm hearing as an idea that, that I'm, I'm not hearing you say uh, that you're open to. What you're saying is, we have a process, we're gonna keep supporting, we're gonna keep going, status quo, we're gonna try to make it easier what I'm saying, that's, that's not gonna help. That so so I just, that's not what I'm saying, I just wanna clarify. Okay. What I'm saying is that we're using our operating funds to support our regulatory requirements. We are also working to make sure that there's a process that is more seamless for resident associations. Resident associations obviously can access stipends, which I know is very different from having a paid job. I, I don't disagree with you um, okay. on the need to um, 
and, and again, professionalize, and I, I agree that's not necessarily the best term, but to pay people for their work. I don't disagree with you. What I'm okay. saying is that the allocation that NYCHA has for administering TPA funds aligns with the requirements that we have, not only with TPA funds, but with all of the resident consultation engagement, all of the regulatory requirements that we have within 964. It not only uses resources from within our resident engagement team, it's our procurement department, it's our legal department, it's our budget department, all of who support this process. And so that doesn't change. But I don't disagree with you that there should be ways in which we can allocate resources to really um, support many emerging leaders. Um, you know, I'm very excited that we have our Resident Leadership Academy, which is offering college credit to leaders in our community who are, you know, professionalizing their work in other ways. But I think it's just two, di two different things that we're discussing, but I don't disagree with the statement that you made. Okay, and maybe we can bring some of that work to, to, to Red Hook and maybe do some pilot, pilot projects and okay. just test things out. I think we, there's a massive laboratory of possibility for, for experimenting, failing, and succeeding. So that, let's, let's, let's not create one process for everybody, but, but allow for, for different developments to offer different, different proposals for modernization of the resident associations. And are there any examples of resident modernization and repair committees that are mandated by HUD 964? Um, that's like another example of, I think, maybe what we're talking about. So committees within the association. Yeah. Um, so offhand, I can't think of, I can't think of any that have formed no. those committees. Um, we do have our resident advisory board, which is part, which is com comprised of resident associations who do annually review the capital plan. Um, development plans, like that is their role, and so that's a citywide committee. Within local resident associations, I, I don't know offhand um, okay. who's formed those committees. Great, there's a lot of energy in Red Hook to, to think differently, and I know some of them are having trouble trying to get information from the presidents, and so how do we, how do we ignite more leadership, mm -hmm. uh, pay them uh, for the work, and just bring more people to the table? So let's keep working on that together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow-up before we go to Councilman Matrega. Um, in reference to the $13 million in unspent funds, um, resident leader Kionas mentioned that she originally had in her, in her development's account $252,000, and then after the reallocation, it dropped down to $89,000. So $252,000 down to $89,000. So can you just clarify um, what the difference is between what um, was in the development um, originally and then after the $13 million was reallocated or redistributed um, down to $89,000? So it'd be helpful to know where that number came from with the 252,000 and what happened. Sure, so I can't speak to, to that specific number. Um, uh, while Ms. Kionas was speaking, I did quickly look up her balance and it's 205,000. Um, so that's, that's the balance that we have as, as of today. Um, I will say, you know, in the past, NYCHA had this process where funding was allocated by the district. And so the, 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 it isn't until 2016 that there is a specific development budget. Um, Douglas is Douglas 1 and Douglas 2, so maybe that's part, right? Douglas 2, I think, or one of the developments within the Douglas Association has a smaller balance. It's possible it was um, reported as only that balance, but it, there, that association has a balance of two developments, um, and it's over 200,000. So are there situations where there are still residents who complain about the fact that prior to the uh, redistribution of the 13 million, they had a significant amount more and, um, and they feel disgruntled or you know, upset or cheated or feel as though NYCHA stole the money or whatever. So can you, can you speak to yeah. that sure. and where those numbers came from? Sure, so again, the funding was allocated by district, which really means that NYCHA tracked it by the nine districts. Resident associations, and this, m much of this process precedes me, but my understanding is that resident associations receive what were called approximated budgets. So approximated budgets, approximated meaning that the budgets, budgets that they had in front of them or, or statements so that they, were sent was were a, not it, actual budgets. Exactly, so there was a definitive budget for the district. The district adopted whatever that was for the year. The, what remained was distributed to the resident associations. Some districts, um, their budgets were 50% of their local allocation. Some were 20%, there was a range, right? And so the local association received what was an approximated budget. That is part of the reason why there was this reform process. The information that they receive now is directly from our general ledger. And so that is the balance for their development. Each quarter they get an update. They see 
encumbrances, rollovers, total allocation, and that information is reported to them on a regular basis. So can you explain to us the rollover process? In the event a resident association does not spend all of their, um, what was budgeted in the beginning, um, and they go into another year, how is that money rolled over? Does it remain within the development? Is it put into an overall so, it, so they receive a letter at the beginning of the year, remains with the development, and the amount that rolled over is in that letter. So NYCHA closes its books the first quarter of the next year, and they would have the, what that total amount is when we closed. And how long will the money roll over if they don't spend all of it on an annual basis? Sure. So we, you know, we only have um, about a year and a half of, of this process underway. Um, and I think in fairness to resident associations, we want to make sure that they continue to have that rollover so that they can um, move to a place of spending their back funds. I think, you know, in the out years, if we get to a place where there's not expenditures um, or there are resident associations that are choosing not to, to spend the funds for whatever reasons, the PHA could work directly to support a resident process for allocating the funds. And so um, that could be anything from bringing in a group to perform a participatory process um, to supporting other resident-led activities like gardens and youth councils and other activities. But our first priority right now is making sure resident associations have the opportunity to expend what was allocated to them. Okay, and one last follow-up in reference to the commercial card. Um, there's a process where if the resident uses the commercial card, they have to then upload receipts or, uh, well, receipts to the system. And there's been some discussion about how that could be sort of difficult for seniors. Um, because NYCHA already tracks the commercial card and what's being used and what the funding is being spent on, do you already have the receipt or like the, the, the statement that you received from the bank that the commercial card was used at this particular you know, facility or with this particular vendor and this was the cost of it? So we have where the transaction occurred, but the receipt is not itemized. And so we still need to ensure just as any fiscal practice, we need to ensure that the money was spent on what the activity was. And, and, and right, this is not, these are our operating funds, they're part of our annual financial audit, so we still need to have the, that kind of control in place. Um, the system reads the receipt so that it confirms that there's a match. Um, and where there's been challenges with uploading, scanning, our staff has gone around to assist TO, TAs. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Traga. Thank you very much, Chair, for holding this very important and I would say very timely hearing. Welcome, uh, Nitra. Uh, just a couple of uh, follow-up questions, and forgive me if I missed some uh, portions earlier. Um, this, this TPA fund, um, it, in your testimony you mentioned that, that HUD mandates its, in terms of its use, is that correct? And um, is it provided, is, it, is this a, a, a fund that HUD creates a dedicated line of funding for, or this is something that NYCHA chooses to optionally create for residents? So this is, uh, HUD allocates a p within our, our operating funds. So within our operating subsidy, there's a, a defined set aside for tenant activities. Right, and so, cause you mentioned that you have 245 active tenant associations, is that correct? Yes. Does HUD budget for the full portfolio that you have or only budgets for the active portfolio that you have? So HUD budgets for the full portfolio. Um, those 245 associations represent around 87% of our portfolio. Um, so right, one association may represent two developments like Queensbridge, for instance, Queensbridge South and North. Um, and then the remaining are where we're, we're working to establish associations or working with associations um, that may be uh, not have a full board or have a restriction to accessing funds because of their compliance. So what happens if, so HUD gives you funding for your full portfolio, but you're acknowledging that some certain, certain complexes for a variety of reasons don't have an active, port, uh, active tenant association. What happens with the funds for those buildings? So at present time, we've, we've allocated them to those developments, and so. How? So they are still, NYCHA is maintaining those, we have custodial accounts um, for the funds, we allocate them by development. Um, and so there are 37 developments where there is either no association or where there's an association but we're working to um, bring them into compliance. Um, so when they are, reach that point, we would be able to release the funds. Our reform process has been underway for about a year and a half. Um, prior to that, there were 24 developments that didn't have an association. We now have 12 that don't have an association, and then the 20 plus or so that 
are in a status of what we would call inactive? Well, I mean, I have one of those developments, Surfside. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any use of, or any type of uh, effort to build capacity. Many residents in the building uh, will reach out to me and they'll become de facto leaders, which I don't mind and I actually do appreciate. But Surfside in Coney Island has been waiting, for example, years after NYCHA received money to rebuild its community center, which is still closed. Um, Surfside has frequent uh, hot water and, and heating issues. So, and I've been now a council member for over five years. I can't recall a, uh, a stable uh, association or in, any efforts to kind of really build capacity there. And so I am questioning where the money went, how it's being used. Um, I'm also curious to know, in your testimony, you mentioned that, and I would appreciate a response on Surfside uh, after I'm finished. Um, some examples of eligible tenant uh, PA, TPA activities include uh, membership activities, information dissemination, resource fairs, and this, this one is interesting, development cleanup days. <laughs> Residents should not be using these funds for operations that NYCHA is responsible for. That is the function of NYCHA. And if you had a more maintenance workers and cleaners for developments uh, and a better ratio to workers to residents, um, they would never, I mean, can you tell me, do you have a percentage breakdown of how they actually are spending their funds? Yeah, so, yeah, so just a few things. So Surfside, Please. I'll start with Surfside. Thank you. Um, I don't personally know the situation at Surfside. Um, I know right now we have over 30 um, so, uh, elections that are underway. I will see if Surfside is on that list and what the attempts there have been. Um, as I mentioned, there are resident associations um, that are inactive or non-established where we have made attempts. Our, our next step is to try to bring on third-party groups who can assist us in that process. So we'll get you an answer on Surfside. Thank you. And we would be happy to work with your office you. on um, ways to help encourage leadership there. Um, in terms of eligible activities, um, the examples that we gave are reflective of some of the proposals that we see come in. I think you're absolutely correct. Tenant associations, residents should not perform NYCHA's obligations. Um, I think what, and that's probably poorly worded, what we've seen are um, proposals for stewardship campaigns, good neighbor campaigns, um, things that are focused on promoting cleanliness, quality of life in the building um, through neighbor to neighbor interaction, not necessarily bringing trash out the compact room or anything of that nature. Um, the majority of funding um, at present time um, is really spent between stipends, office equipment, supplies, a lot of the funding is actually um, allocated to activities that are like baseline activities within the Resident Association, meeting refreshments, et cetera. Um, with this new process, we are starting to see more and more proposals that are, um, include activities like the go bags and um, you know, educational resource fairs or some of the examples that you heard this morning where people brought in third party consultants to their development on specific issues. And so there's a real opportunity with some of the funding that has rolled over to um, you know, work towards some big projects while still making sure that the baseline needs of the association are met. But do you have the overall spending categorized based on different areas? in terms of where money is being we spent? We do, so I don't have that with me, but we can give um, to, to you and to all the council members just what the spend, expenditures were within your districts um, by category. And when you say proposals, it seems that there's like additional added layers of burden on the tenant associations to acquire resources that are dedicated for them. Um, so, you've switched over to this card. Why do I still hear complaints from residents that there's a significant turnaround time or the turnaround time is so, you know, it's, it's very, um, for example, uh, I'm sure the chair knows that uh, summertime is usually family day time uh, for, for NYCHA presidents. Our budget adoption usually is around early June, hopefully, hopefully again early June, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But family days begin sometimes in July and August. And I know when it comes to the school system, if we allocate funds for PTAs or for schools, it takes months and months and months for things to process. Their family days, they work so hard to put together a beautiful community event, but I keep hearing that the money's not available for them on time for their family days. 
Uh, can you speak to this? Sure, so just quickly on Surfside, there is an election underway at Surfside now. Oh, wow, great. Um, so we will connect with your office. Thank you. Um, an election is 60 to 90 days um, based on the guidelines, so we'll, we'll be connected with you on that. Great. Um, in terms of the, the turnaround time, so um, in the proposals, so we, um, we need to provide, ensure that the expenditures have justification within the TA's own words. Um, the proposal is really a form, it's a one page form. Um, there are check boxes based on the eligibility criteria. We work to make it as simplified as possible, but we need the tenant association to express um, what their activity is relative to, to the guidelines. It's a, it's a, it's a one, one page form. We're actually still looking to eliminate that for what we consider to be basic requests. Um, the proposals um, are submitted, they are reviewed for approval or disapproval, and then they move to processing. I think the concern that you're speaking about really is a reflection of um, one of the many reasons why we introduced the commercial card. So once the, the form is re reviewed for eligibility and it's approved, if you have a commercial card, you can go forth and spend. Um, you also can just submit a quarterly f uh, request for all of your activities, and that funding is available to you on your card within the quarter. If not, you're submitting a proposal and then NYCH is moving your request through our procurement chain. Um, and so, the, as I mentioned earlier, like the supply chain systems that we're using for an agency of $3 billion, we're using for a ream of paper. It's a not efficient, it's, not, it's an inefficient process. Right, but for example, I, I have around nine, nine developments in my district. I give each development funds. Our budget is adopted in June. Family days begin July, August. A frequent complaint that I get is that the money is not available for them to withdraw, with, withdraw from come family day, and they have to pay invoices, they have to pay folks for rides or food or other types of attractions. Why can't NYCHA get them the funds in time for this event? Sure. So I was just going to segue yes. into family day. Um, so just one more point about the commercial card. I know in your district, um, your district was one of the districts where we had very few commercial card holders, and that's recently changed. So um, through the leadership of, of that district leader, um, our team ha has um, gone out and provided training, so a number of your TAs will be on the commercial card this summer, and that will make a big difference. Um, because again, once your family day application is in, we move forward with um, the, it's, uh, the funding availabilities on your card relative to your TPA funds. City council funds are, are different, so when we receive the funding, in order to release the next year allocation, we need to ensure that we have receipts from the prior year. And so some of the challenges that we have are um, outstanding receipts, in, in certain instances, and so we um, provided a letter to associations before the summer reminding them if they have any outstanding items that we need to receive them. I think one of the other challenges that we saw um, was uh, electron electronic funds transfer versus paper checks. So we had a number of issues, and I remember in your district in particular where there were checks lost, et cetera. So we're working to make sure that as soon as we get notice of availability of the funding, um, that we already have the allocations, but the expend the the payments right. teed up for your. I appreciate their uh, explanation, but are these associations 501c3s? So th there, some are some, but because you're treating them like they are in terms of the way this whole process is set up, and I hear that some of them are trying to look at, or exploring the possibility of becoming a 501c3, um, but it really appears that you're treating them like CBOs that we fund in our districts with you know, uh, all these types of receipts, reimbursements, and paperwork. And one of the issues we hear from CBO providers is the amount of compliance and paperwork that they have to deal with when the folks just want to you know, make sure that the residents' needs are being met and build capacity in their, in their, in their building and create social activities, or, 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 or in some cases I'm reading here, cleanup days, which should not be paid for through them, their funds. But um, what, what are we doing to help build capacity and to reduce paperwork and com you know complications so these funds flow more smoothly of course we, i understand that compliance is necessary but we're treating them like 501c3s when in fact they're not and do you have data on how many of them are 501c3s out of the 247 so i don't have that on hand I, we, we right. can get that information um but I, the, the process is not what we would expect. Of, so we receive allocations for CBOs from council members. That is a much more protracted, we enter into agreements with them. That's not what we're doing with TAs. We get the allocation, we, we provide them with a letter of what has, they've already received a letter from the council member of what has been allocated. If they've already returned in receipts from last year, they're good to go. There's a one-page form, 
they fill it out, they send it to us, and the check is released. Mm. If they have not turned in receipts, and I think that's a very basic request, then we are not able to release funding until such time that the re those receipts have been provided to us. And so we provide reminders throughout the year. We are actually hosting orientations for family day season in May. We will be out at every single district to go through what that process is. Is there a base amount that you provide in terms of TP the TPA? And forgive me if that was covered earlier, I'm just curious. So there is um, a $15 per dwelling unit subject to proration. Fifteen dollars per dwelling, and who who set that ratio? Who set so that? So that's based on the HUD formula. Does HUD tell you that that's the floor or that's the ceiling? So the this it's twenty five dollars per dwelling unit. Forty percent remains with the PHA. Sixty percent goes to the resident association. So the maximum potential is twenty five dollars per unit. Right. The resident portion has been fifteen dollars. My my colleague had mentioned before, and and thanks for the time, Chair. I'm wrapping up, but my colleague mentioned before that. 40, up to 40% is optional, it's not mandatory. My question is, is this $15 per, per unit, is this an option too, or this is something that NYCHA just, you know, is, tell, is it a mandate or is it is it discretionary or arbitrary from NYCHA's uh, leadership? So it's arbitrary, it, it is required for us to allocate the, the funding right. per unit, right. um, and we do, and, and our requirements do, don't change, right? So whether we take the 40% or not, we still have these regulatory requirements to meet. Right. I'm gonna just conclude, in addition to, certainly I, I echo the concerns from my colleagues that I think that, that this process is still unnecessarily burdensome and complex for residents. I'm also concerned, Chair, and, 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 and to uh, folks here, that I, I am concerned that tenant associations are, are being forced to spend money on items that really are the responsibility of NYCHA, their day-to-day -day operations and functions. Um, when I hear from some tenant associations in my district, for example, if I could allocate funds for a functioning computer, I would imagine that when you help set up a TA, uh, you know, association, that they have an office and that they have a computer and that they have basic supplies. It's almost like, forgive me for thinking common sense sh should be common. Uh, just like a, you know, a, a, a classroom teacher should have paper and pens and pencils in the class. So. We need to define what a TA uh, office is, what, should, what it should include, and they should not be charged for coming up with the base amount of supplies and base things just to open and stay functioning. I think these resources are, are to supplement what a, uh, a thriving association should already have. Um, and so, and I, I would just urge NYCHA, as we're fighting very hard to get more resources to NYCHA, because Make no mistake, folks, NYCHA is in great need of additional resources from Washington, the state, uh, the city as well. But we need to make sure that those, those resources reach the developments and that they're not paying for things that should be covered on a day-to-day -day basis by NYCHA operations. Uh, and so I thank the chair very much for this very, I think, important and timely, uh, timely hearing because, quite frankly, there's a lot of work to do. Thank you so much. And we're winding up now. Um, I just have just a couple more questions and um, my colleague, Councilmember Gibson, um, has some follow-up as well. NYCHA's latest development plan, NYCHA 2.0, relies heavily on the RAD program. What steps or guidelines has NYCHA put in place to facilitate the usage of TPA funds in the RAD developments and how will NYCHA guarantee that in mixed income developments, TPA funds are directed to only low-income residents? So can you just explain the TPA process if there is one for um, RAD or PACT and what you've done in the past and what the plan is? Sure, so we are um, requiring all of our development partners to have TPA within their, um, their program regardless of the, the preservation tool. So RAD, PACT, um, will, the PACT program in its totality will include that. That's in the operating agreement between NYCHA and the new landlord. And whatever um, back funds are in those accounts now will move over with the... So our budget department has already started that process. When we close, they release to the, um, the new owner to work with the resident association. New allocations come out of the managing agent's budget. Okay. Councilmember Gibson. 
Uh, just a quick question. Um, it's been referenced that there is a June 1st deadline for the remaining uh, RAs that have not been in compliant with the TPA agreement. Um, you referenced that NYCHA is looking to bring on a social service provider. So my question is timing. Um, is that June 1st deadline real? Um, and when are you going to bring on this social service provider? So so we the, the timing for the June 1st is, is, is correct. Um, we're working one-on-one -on -one with those specific TAs who are not using the commercial card. We are looking to bring providers on in the fall. That's specifically in developments where there is not an association. So those are uh, two different timelines. Okay. And are we expecting to pay the social service provider? So in the for the small developments, yes, we would be looking to bring on providers um, that we would fund to do that work. Um, it would probably be subject to a competitive process, so I, I can't speak in great detail, but the goal would be to work with the developments where there has been no established association after we complete this current election cycle. Okay, so is it accurate to say that NYCHA is going to use its operating dollars to pay for this and it will not have any impact on the TPA funds for the social service because it's, it's something separate. You're talking about building up tenants associations where there are none. Correct. So, so the, the funds are still allocated for that purpose. So we would be working to, whether it's NYCHA's operating funds or the, the TPA funds for the development specifically for that purpose, the funding source is still, and the amount um, is still being defined, but it wouldn't impact any current tenant associations. Okay, and as um, you process and review some of the proposals that we've talked about, um, in terms of, I'm going back to uh, timeliness and expediting, um, some of the approvals of these proposals. Uh, there have been several instances in my district where uh, Council Member Traeger talked about upcoming family days. So how closely does NYCHA pay attention when a, a proposal is submitted and there's an actual event associated with that? Um, does that have any impact on expediting the approval? Because I've had multiple instances where money was put on the commercial card the night before a scheduled family day, meaning the night before after bank hours, after office hours, um, money was put on commercial cards after five o'clock, essentially not even allowing the tenants associations to be able to purchase items for their family day. So I guess overall, while I cited just one specific instance, but do you pay attention to deadlines and events and things like that as you're reviewing these proposals? We do, and so that is exactly why we have the family ori day orientations in May. A resident association right in that meeting can drop off their family day application. The family day in and of itself is its own event. There's an application. It's the same as it's been for many years. They can submit it that day and we would begin processing. I think the issue is, and we're happy to share with each council member, in certain districts we've had challenges collecting receipts on time or getting the family day application on time. And so if there's ways that we can work with the council member to assist in our follow-up with the resident association, we're happy um, to collaborate and do that. We can also make sure that you're included when we send out um, reminder notices to resident associations regarding their city council allocations in particular. Okay, I'd appreciate that. I know you cited that each of the RAs works with a resident coordinator. Um, I'm sure most of my colleagues don't know who the coordinators are um, because there really isn't any engagement. Um, it would be great if we could get that information beforehand and if there's an ongoing dialogue. It doesn't have to be a dialogue when there's only an issue. It should be an ongoing dialogue. We talk to our tenants associations all the time and we at the council often get information on the ground before we get it from our own you know, resident coordinators or property managers. That has been the case as long as I've been here at the City Council. And while I know today's hearing is very specific to TPA, but generally speaking, the communication at NYCHA has got to improve. It is insulting to us as council members and it's insulting to our resident association leaders. We are the ones that are on the ground every day in these developments, more so than staff, that really understand what's happening. And so as we are looking to make improvements, as you're looking to identify the gaps in the system and improve efficiency, I really, really, really urge you to communicate to the residents' associations. Understand what they're going through and be willing to help them. I mean, everyone's talked about the willingness to help, but it's just talk. It has to be action. 
And I understand things have been done, but I'm saying it's not enough. And so on behalf of my districts in the Bronx, I expect more from NYCHA because the residents I represent expect more of me. And I give them as much as I can, and I'm asking NYCHA to do more. This process has not been off the ground in a good way. It has not been smooth. And even now, two years later, I recognize that we have more to do, but it's helpful and it makes your job much easier if you're talking to the resident associations and engaging with them through the entire process. Not when a decision is made and you tell them about it, but as we're looking to make these changes in the program. So just a couple of suggestions, because these are the things I'm hearing from my tenants associations, and it just would be helpful as we move forward Forward if we are to have a real productive working relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. So I, um, I don't have any more questions. Um, there were a few questions that came um, that we will submit to you um, in writing along with the follow-up letter. Um, but I just want to say that for so long, no one has really looked out for the residents to the level that they deserve. And over the past few years, there's been a consistent amount of attention and focus on the residents and their living conditions. We are thankful that this money that's allocated from HUD exists, right? Elected officials do what they can, when they can, through discretionary funds. But this is funding that is actually built into the law is built into the actual CFR. And so at this point, if we don't get anything right, we should be able to get this process right. Because this funding is literally about livelihood, right? A resident said earlier, we're not talking about mold. We're not talking about lead right now. We're just talking about funding that is in the law that should be allocated directly to residents to address civic engagement, their livelihood, and how to be, you know, one with their neighbors. And so again, if we don't get this right, what the heck else is gonna be correct? And so I really, you know, just state on the record, and you know, I'm thankful to everybody who, who's here and the tenants that showed up and testified for an hour and a half this morning. But let's just get this right and utilize us as a true partner mm -hmm. along with the residents. Um, so that's all I have to say. And we will hear from our last resident who showed up right after the resident panels. Um, so, Mr. Tyrone Ball. Am I pressing this? Okay, yes. There we go. Good afternoon. All right, I think that's better. Good afternoon. I had a couple of questions about TPA. One, the turnaround time between requesting and need. Sometimes two weeks is not enough. It is way too much. You know, when you need equipment for computer labs and whatever, this is now the time that we're actually going in and getting children into their summer youth program. Most of that is digitized. So when we need wire leads to upgrade our systems or reconnect, we need to have that sooner rather than later. And there's a lag time between that. Also, we pay 20% into our district. But does the district get a card? Are they able to use the funds? Or is this just 20% that's coming out of our TPA for no reason? There's several other things. Um, how is 1.5 million 40% of 3 million, and that should be 50. I'm not seeing any of that. So if anybody could actually answer those questions, I'll be, I would love to hear it. 
It was a quick statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I just want to, as we close today's hearing, I just want to thank committee staff, Madiba Denny Council, Jose Condi, um, the senior legislative policy analyst, Ricky Chawla, the legislative policy analyst, and Sarah Goslum, the principal financial analyst, as well as my staff um, within the 41st Council District. So thank you so much for your time. And again, let's just get this right. And I look forward to our... I, I'm We're sorry about to, to interrupt this meeting, we, but Ms. this Glover? needs to be said. The mission statements on the bylaws at these tennis associations states... Ms. Okay. The board is in our court. Management, our uh, veteran associations are the conduit between management and tenants. Okay, thank you, Mr. Let me let me let me end this hearing. Thank you so much. This is the end of the NYCHA Management and Tenant Participation Activity Funds Oversight Hearing on April 15th with the Public Housing Committee. Thank you.